So I'm going to ask that people um, really stay focused in their comments, uh, and that they listen to the things that other people have to say, so that if somebody says whatever it was you had to say, you can take your hand down or pass or not repeat what's already been said, or perhaps just go like this to say that you agree. Um, so I need a volunteer to take minutes. Um, Nobles, are you willing to do that while you're I've already here? started. I've already started. <laughs> you're the best, man. Thank you so much. No worries. So good evening. Happy Flag Day. Uh, this is the June 14th meeting of the Parks and Cultural Affairs Committee of Community Board 12. Um, we're going, we might be going a little bit out of order on the agenda um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we have, um, we have a, a long-awaited presentation from uh, EDC and the People's Theater Project on the Immigrant Research and Performing Arts Center. I have that a little bit later in the agenda, so I think that's going to work, but apparently uh, PTP has some timing issues and they um, can't come until later in the agenda. So we might have to stall for time and rearrange things if they're not ready yet when we get to them. We also have a presentation or a brief conversation with the Deputy Commissioner of, Public, of uh, Cultural Affairs, um, who I think may be on the call already. I am, uh, I'm here, Sheila Feinberg, I'm here. Excellent, thank you. Sorry, Sheila, I, have, no I have your name and another email. And as I explained, um, I'm just, um, I'm doing this on an iPad, which feels really strange to me. It's all good. Um, totally discombobulated. So I might, you know, as I said, play with the agenda a little bit, depending on who's here, who's coming, who's going, who needs to leave, what have you. Um, by way of welcoming remarks, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this will be our last meeting of the, of the season, as it were, since we are not required to meet over the summer. Um, and uh, I do not at the moment have plans uh, for a July or August meeting. Um, and I think this is gonna be our last meeting on Zoom. One of the things that uh, all of the chairs, our committee chairs are going to be tasked with is learning the uh, new hardware that we have so that we can do um, hybrid meetings. We can go back to meeting in person, but also continue to have the kind of remote representation and participation that we have enjoyed uh, during the pandemic. Um, I miss in-person meetings. I think there's something that's really lost when we're all in our Hollywood square boxes. Um, so I'm looking forward to being back in person, but I really appreciate the level of uh, broad participation that we've been able to have uh, because of Zoom. So I'm hoping that when we go back to in-person meetings, we don't lose that. Um, I have a brief update from Roe, New York, that uh, we were going to be, uh, they, they are going before the FCRC, the, the New York City Franchise Review and FC, Franchise Concession Review Commission. I always get that wrong. Um, for the sole source contract for operating the, uh, the programming at uh, the Sherman Creek Boathouse. Uh, that was supposed to be happening at the June FCRC meeting, which would have been on mo uh, Monday of last week. But there were some issues, and so they, uh, I believe, are deferring to uh, July. I will be, uh, I've prepared some testimony, which is basically a recycled version of the testimony that I offered to the uh, PDC when they went before them, um, just echoing the board's full support for that project as is reflected in the resolution that we passed back in um, September of 2019. <clears throat> and the, the Peter J. Sharp Boathouse has not yet been, yet been removed. They're having some issues uh, identifying the getting the barge that would tow it away to tow it away. So uh, I, I don't know, I've never tried to rent a barge to tow away a boathouse, but I imagine it's a thing. And I'm not surprised to learn that it's a little bit more complicated than anybody would have liked. 
Um, Nobles, do you want to talk a little bit about the, just give a, a you know, a, a minute or two summary of what you learned at the uh, Land Use Committee and their presentation on the Morris Jumel Mansion and the Dykeman Farmhouse Projects. Any surprises there? Anything we need to know? I appreciate it. If you could take over the minutes for me for a second then. Uh, so first and foremost, as an awesome going theme in our community for Northern Manhattan, we've seen it a lot here in the resolutions that we've been passing since we've been on the board for such a long time. We're seeing in other committees, but ADA design is coming to Northern Manhattan, which is absolutely amazing. And we have a lot of attention on it. That being said, uh, when it comes to the two locations that Liz just mentioned, um, Morris Jamel Mansion and the Dykeman Farmhouse, uh, land use actually, and, and Liz, if you could just wax poetic for two seconds on why it was in front of land use one more time, I believe it's because so, of the commission that it's in front of. Yeah, so typically, even though these are historic houses with cultural import that both rest within parks and go through uh, the historic the historic house trust um, and the parks department, um, they um, the designs would be presented to the Public Design Commission and um, the landmarks, uh, the, the land, LPC, Landmarks Preservation Commission. So that usually, things that go through LPC usually go through the Land Use Committee. Um, we could have done a joint resolution based on a presentation to land use and a presentation to parks. But I just thought like people don't have that kind of time and I didn't want to drag people, drag the presenters to a second meeting. Wayne is perfectly, is more than competent to manage this issue. So it seemed reasonable to just go through land use. I asked for wax poetic and we got it, but that is the full context folks of how we got to land use from ours. Um, and, and, and that's why it was there. That being said, just give me two seconds. I'm single parenting right now and the delivery is here, but I will keep okay. talking. That being said, from an ADA perspective, uh, there are a lot of things. Yep, I think we lost no balls. My seven-year-old got it now. She turned seven today as well. Uh, she's got it. So anyway, uh, when it comes to ADA changes, there were a lot of conversations around both projects, around the structural integrity and the historic uh, I guess, authenticity of what those changes will look like. Uh, everyone trusted the design in terms of how accessible they will be and also in terms of, you know, how they fulfilled the ADA requirement of those places. But a lot of the, many of the, many of the questions that surrounded both projects were more about the cosmetic in terms of like, will this railing, you know, add a different kind of ambiance to the walk up when you have to do this, that, and this? You know, how is the front entrance going to change in this regard? Um, and it did seem that the community from their public questions, nice job, Hazel. Uh, it did seem that the community from their public questions were happy with the answers. Um, so that being said, you can certainly see, I believe there was a resolution that did come out. I had to leave a little bit early that night at a work event. Um, but I do believe that there was a resolution that came out of it that was unanimous in favor because both the votes I had there um, for the committee members and folks that were not on the committee, but board members, both votes were unanimous in favor. I think we might've had a one or two extensions, Steve, um, when I was there. I'm seeing in the, in the Q&A from Allegra Le, Legrand, she says the majority of changes at Dykeman Farmhouse are to take 20% of the land area for a ramp that leads to a poorly windowed lower level so that caretakers can live on site, which is not ADA accessible. Why? Little if any discussion of landscape architecture changes there, pretty disappointing. No more outdoor theater at Dykeman Farmhouse, minimal attention to outdoor learning space. ADA ramps are good, the rest could do much better. Um, and rather than typing an answer, I'm gonna answer part of that live. Um, so my understanding is that part of what's taking up a lot of the real estate quite literally at the Dykeman Farmhouse is the um, is an addition which is historically consistent. It replaces something which had been added um, uh, in prior centuries and then was then removed uh, earlier uh, at, at the turn of the last century. Um, I believe that there is a um, 
both the Morris Jamel Mansion and the Dykeman Farmhouse have caretakers that live on site. The importance of having somebody live on site to take care of the property, to ensure that it's not vandalized, to ensure that uh, the surrounding area stays safe and that the place is generally maintained and upkept. I think, I think the value of that is kind of obvious and speaks for itself. So I'm not really sure what the, what the issue is there. And um, uh, yeah, I think the loss of, of outdoor programming, I think there's still gonna be the ability for some outdoor programming on the porch, but there isn't gonna be that same space over by the Hessian hut. Um, so I hope that answers those questions. Uh, anything else? Liz? Yes. I just oh, wanted, Jennifer, yes, please. Just wanted to say that ha having a caretaker on site, given the age of those buildings, you, if a steam pipe explodes, you know, you run the risk of losing your entire historic collection. So it's a matter of maintenance, but it's also protecting sort of the, the historical treasures that are in, in those facilities. Um, old things do periodically break down and just having someone to immediately respond is incredibly important. Yeah, as a reminder, when the pipe burst in Morris Jamel in 2019, if it wasn't for the caretakers that were there, that whole place could have just, I mean, there would have been no saving it. So it's just, it's really important. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so I think that uh, we don't really need to do anything with this agenda item. I just wanted to let, or with this update, I just wanted to let people know that, that what was, that's what was happening in those other committees. Um, Sorry, and uh, uh, Nobles, you're, Nobles, you're not on mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed a couple minutes there. I, uh, no I had to get the dinner from the top. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, hold on a second. I'm just making a note of what you missed so that I can send that to you. Thank you. And I'll take a look at the recording as well. Okay. I'm surprised to hear that there's a descendant of the actual family that lived in the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, that's not who the caretaker is, but they're on the board, which I think is pretty cool. So the last yeah. update, um, I know that there is a lot, there has been a lot of um, public outcry and interest in the Greenway renovation and the way that traffic would be um, rerouted going down Broadway, that there would be danger to cyclists. There are a lot of issues there. I understand that people wanted to have it on the agenda to discuss. Um, I'm not putting it on the agenda to discuss, because, but I did wanna give um, a little bit of an update on what's going on. Uh, although it's a parks project, the, it relates very much to DOT. Danny, this is really distracting. What's going on here? <laughs> uh, oh, hello. You got you, you can cut your camera off, dude. <laughs> and, a bit, and a little bit of breakthrough. That was that was super strange. Um, so there's um, it's a parks project, but it was discussed pretty substantially in the traffic and transportation committee uh, committee last week. The response was far from satisfactory. Um, in the interim, uh, I do want to thank Allegra Legrand for uh, her particularly pointed comments uh, and reminding us about our resolution. I, I had thought that we had had a resolution, but I couldn't actually find it. So once I got that from her, I did send that to the borough president's office. They have contacted the um, uh, commissioners of parks and of transportation to try and get a better resolution on that. Um, and the Parks Department has also been meeting with, with state DOT because there's a little bit of mixed uh, purview. Parts of the Henry Hudson Parkway, parts of the closure area come under state DOT, parts of it come under city DOT. So um, the Parks Department has reached out to state DOT. And in the meantime, they've actually paused the project until 
things can be a little bit better figured out. So we could totally talk about this and, and point out the obvious problems here, but I just don't think that's productive. We know the obvious problems and because of community advocacy and involvement of you know, just regular everyday people uh, who care about this stuff, uh, working with the community board and elected officials, the people who need to be talking to each other are talking to each other, and I'm hoping they can come up with something better than uh, what was happening before. So thank you everybody for your involvement, um, but I don't think that we need to have another resolution because all of the things that we would put in a resolution as to why this is important, we've already said, and we've reminded the relevant elected officials and agency representatives that we've already said that and we expect them to you know, do their jobs. So uh, I, that's really all I have to say about that. So with that, um, okay, with that, uh, it's 6.52 and I wanna move to the, um, the programming updates from cultural and friends of parks organizations. Y'all know the drill. Uh, people are just gonna raise their hands and speak in the order in which um, I'll call on you in the order in, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the, at the Q and A, which everybody doesn't have the benefit of seeing. And since it's a public meeting, uh, questions need to be raised. Um, uh, Questions need to be, it, only the panelists can see the questions. So if they're gonna be part of the meeting, I have to read them. Um, Allegra says a resolution from parks to commit to contractors cementing a safe detour before permits are issued, not a la carte in general every time. Totally useful feedback and thank you for that. Um, Angelo, Petriotis, I hope I pronounced that correctly, says, I am new. Are all the people on the panel members? Can anyone be on the panel? I'm not currently, I'm not ready. Uh, currently just curious how this works. So how this works is the panelists are members of the board and people who are presenting on a particular agenda item um, that had been arranged previously. Um, people who are not panelists will be can be invited to unmute and can speak they won't be on screen but we will be able we will all be able to hear you uh, so if you would like to do that uh, if you have a question or whatever you can raise use the raise hand feature um, that's how that works i hope that was helpful so next up participants attendee list. I, I know you're on the iPad. Certainly let me know if you need okay, some so help. Okay, so I've got, I've got tr uh, Trisha Anderton, followed by Roxana Petzold, followed by Alexander Campos. Um, can I get a volunteer to keep time? Uh, if, the actually, folks in the, if the folks no, in the you know what, updates. I, no, I can do that. I'll just keep. So everybody's going to have uh, a minute and a half. Uh, when you hear the timer go off, that's your, that's how you know you have 15 seconds. So uh, Trish, Trish Anderton, what you got? I actually got nothing because Roxana is doing the Inwood Canoe Club update. So I pass. Thank you very much. Okay. Then lower your hand and oh, I just Roxana. Sorry. No worries. Roxana, what you got? Hey, thanks, Liz. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, on behalf of Inwood Canoe Club, um, we're here. We're celebrating our 120th year anniversary, and we want to invite everyone to come celebrate with us. A great way to do that is to join us Sunday mornings. Every weekend until Labor Day, guests can join us for free guided paddling trips on the Hudson River. We're located just south of the Dykeman Marina and the Hudson Restaurant. So you go all the way to the western end of Dykeman, hang a left, walk about 50 yards, sign up at 9 a.m. for one of the three time slots. You do need to sign up in person. 
Um, I'm really happy to also note that after three successful weekends in a row, we've determined that we can increase capacity beginning this Sunday. So uh, the spaces are limited, but do come in and sign up. Um, inwindcanoenyc.org is our website, and I think that'll be provided in the notes as well. A few other quick highlights. Um, we are going to start offering free small instructional classes on the water on Saturdays. Um, these will be uh, hosted by our certified paddle sports instructors. Um, there'll be some more information on how to do that, but you can go to our website for that information as well. And a couple of other quick notes. Um, we're really thrilled that we have been working with a number of youth uh, organizations. Um, already we've had three sessions with a group of students from City Parks Foundation's Coastal Classroom. We've had an afternoon with, in, with scouts um, from the Inwood-based Girl Scout Troop 3205. And we did a wonderful evening with um, to support, uh, to recognize Pride Month with New Alternatives, which is a nonprofit that supports unhoused LGBTQ plus youth. Um, we still are in the planning stage of a few other programs, um, including conversations with the Lenape Center about indigenous uh, relationships to our neighborhood in the river. Um, we're going to be also doing another summer with Heroes on the Hudson, which is a Wounded Warriors program. More youth Hi. programs. And thank you, Liz. <laughs> a quick question. Uh, you said you have three time slots. What are the three time slots? Um, they run between nine and noon. So we recommend that you get there at nine to sign up. Um, usually they're about 45 minutes apart, but you do need to be there in person. Got it. Okie dokie. Thank you. Um, all right. Next up, we have Alexander Campos from the Hispanic Society. Wait, hold on a second. Let me scroll over. I do not like doing this with on an iPad, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, all right, Alexander, I've got your hand lowered and unmuted, I hope. Good evening, everyone. Yes, thank you, Liz. Uh, very quickly, our summer exhibition, American Travelers, a watercolor journey through Spain, Portugal, and Mexico, opens this Friday to the public. And it will be running through October 16th. So it will be running Thursday through Sunday uh, from 10 to 12 to 6, free to the public. So that's starting July 17th to October 16th. Thursday through Sunday, noon to 6, free of charge. And it features basically around 80 watercolors and like 30 ceramics, uh, decorative art pieces. And it's really a wonderful exhibition of watercolors from our collection. Uh, ranging from the early part of the 20th, 20th century to recent work by Timothy Clark. In addition to that, we have, um, a, we're doing a collaboration with NOMA and Columbia University this Saturday, one through four, called Spontaneous Minds. It's an improvisational performance with Andrea Arroyo and Miguel Zenon, who's a jazz performer. And Andrea will be painting to his music. Uh, it's band. And that's one through four with a performance at two, and there'll be some art making workshops with Columbia University's neurological department. Uh, Miguel is a fellow at the department there. And then on Sunday, we are hosting Mano a Mano, a culture, uh, cultural, Mexican culture without borders. We're doing a taste of Mexico and that's from three to five. And they'll have food, a Chicana music and art making workshops on our terrace as well. And that's the Sunday, three to five. And then Saturday, June 25th, we are hosting Jazz Power Initiative for a 19-piece jazz performance on the terrace. And that's also from three to five. So please, every weekend, this, uh, uh, come to the Hispanic Society. And of course, come see the ex new exhibition that will be on view to October. Great. Thank you so much. I am delighted that that all sounds really good. And, and as usual, if you could just send that to uh, a short version of that to Noble so that he has them for the minutes would be great. Um, let me just see. I think we don't have any other. Uh, we've got Alexis Marnell from uh, Classical Theater of Harlem. I always like it when Alexis and Alex follow each other because I just think that's humorous. <laughs> uh, 
Alexa, um, can somebody promote Alexis to? No, um, me too. Oh, she has to just unmute herself. What, what, what's her name again? Alexis Marnell. Yep, she's, she's unmuted she's right now. Yeah, yeah, but she's a mem she's a member of the committee, so she should be. Yeah, a she, she she's, is, she's already here. She is. Oh, she's okay. already here. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. you're good, okay. Alexis. <laughs> okay, so uh, Marcus Garvey Park, Uptown Shakespeare in the Park, starts July 5th through the 29th. We are very proud to present Twelfth Night with the um, Tony Award nominee for Clyde's Cara Young as Viola. Uh, we are also going to have um, Thursday through Sundays during the run, uh, we're going to have pop-up vendor programs. We're working with Union Settlement, um, Harlem Park to Park, and Uptown Grand Central. Uh, and also, we, this year we are doing student internships through Summer Youth Employment Program for uh, youth ages 18 to 24 um, that are interested in backstage careers in the theater. And for uh, students who are not through SYEP, I also have some grant money for um, anyone who is interested. Uh, you can email me at alexis at cthnyc.org and I will send all that info to Nobles. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next up, Maggie Clark from the Riverside Inwood Neighborhood Garden. Let me just uh, unmute you. And actually, Maggie, sorry, before um, Maggie, before you start, I'm I'm seeing in the attendee list <clears throat> there are three people named Cameron Becker, and that usually happens when somebody signs up for the meeting, registers for the meeting, and then shares the link with other neighbors. Hey, I'm going to this meeting, here's the link. That's fine, but it feels weird to me not to know who's actually here. So if the real Cameron Becker doesn't need to do anything, but if the two Cameron Beckers who aren't actually Cameron Becker could please rename themselves with what their name is, we'll have better attendance records. And also if you raise your hand, I can address you by your actual name, not your neighbor's name. Um, Maggie, wait, what happened to Maggie? Maggie Clark. She's back on attendees. Okay, I saw, I'm not, ah, here we go. Maggie, are you, the, you're, uh, you should be unmuted. Here we go. Here we go. I am unmuted. Excellent. I, I am sitting in the ring garden and uh, we're going to have our annual art in the garden this Saturday, 12 to four. Uh, we usually have a dozen artists with uh, a few works each on poles all around the garden. And there's also uh, performances, musical, poetry and dance, um, 12 to four at the garden, which is uh, surrounded by Dykeman Street, Riverside Drive and Seaman at Broadway. Fantastic, thank you so much. I look forward to it. I hopefully will be back in town. Excellent. Um, all right, next up we have uh, Alexis Sanborn. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm uh, speaking about the community garden at uh, Fort Washington Collegiate Church. Uh-huh. Um, I was wondering if I could share my screen, if that's possible. Um, I'll keep uh, it under a minute and a half. I believe you have the ability as a presenter to share a screen. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I wanted to introduce uh, to you a new garden initiative at Fort Washington Collegiate Church, which is located at the corner of 181st Street and Fort Washington Avenue, uh, right near the south entrance of the A train. Um, I'm a volunteer there. Uh, I'm not, not an employee of the church, but I am helping to lead the garden initiative. And the garden was founded in, two, in 2021. We received a grant from New York Restoration Project. And our first year was kind of a trial experiment of seeing what we could grow, seeing how um, people interacted with the space. Um, and uh, you can see here the fruits of our labor from last year. 
Um, the garden was uh, started basically in June and we kept on harvesting crops until about November. And we overwintered some vegetables that uh, we actually harvested as early as March. Um, you can see here tomatoes, kids in the garden. Uh, we, we coordinate activities with the children's ministry at the church, also do special events. Um, also later last year, we built cold frames for the garden to help uh, grow more things from seed. We participated in the daffodil project and planted um, about 1,200 1, bulbs around the neighborhood and in the garden and about half of them came up, uh, but we had fun doing it. And then so far in this year, in 2020, uh, 2022 rather, we received a second uh, grant to help transform the space further from New York Restoration Project. And um, we've hosted a plant swap just last weekend in coordination with the Washington Heights Inwood uh, Facebook group. So here are a few more pictures. Um, if you would like to get involved, uh, we have public garden hours Thursdays after work time at 5.30 p.m and uh, they go to about seven, and then Sundays around 12 p.m., um, if the weather's good. Uh, if the weather's rainy, then there's no open garden. Um, you can follow us on Fort Washington Green. That's our the garden's official name. And if you'd like to get involved, um, sign up to be part of garden leadership and receive our email updates, just email fortwashgarden at gmail.com. Fantastic. So, thank you. Um, Thank you. And if you could send um, me, uh, my email is Liz Ritter, L-I-Z-R-I-T-T-E-R dot C as in community, B as in board, 12 M as in Manhattan at gmail.com. Just a quick couple of sentences so that we can drop that into the minutes. And you can also copy um, nobles at What's your email, Nobles? I just heard you do plant swap. We did. We did a plant swap, yeah. Uh, and if you want to CC me, uh, it's Nobles, like my first name here at Barnes & Noble with an S, 1983 at gmail.com. Yeah. Um, yeah, and if it's okay with you, uh, Maggie and um, Alexis, I'm happy to send you an email introducing the two of you so that if you're doing plant swaps in the future, you can, uh, you know, Uptown Gardeners Unite. Oh yeah, that... we got lots of certain things that we'd like to exchange. Great, is that okay with you, Alexis? Yeah. No, we'd love it, thank you. Okay, great. So that's actually the part that I really miss about in-person meetings. People connect up with each other and have little side conversations in the back of the room and it's a beautiful thing. I miss that. I'm happy to put people together, but it's not quite as efficient on Zoom. Um, okay. Um, instructions on how to rename oneself. I'm not looking at the screen, but I think if you look at your name, there should be like three dots next to it. And if you hover over that, there will be a drop down menu that offers you the opportunity to rename yourself. Let me know if that works. Um, okay, I think we don't have any other um, uh, CBO presenters. I usually let Jennifer go last as a segue into her report, but we have a request from NYRP to give a brief presentation and we don't really have a lot of space to add a new agenda item and it does kind of fit here. So I'm going to um, exercise my prerogative as chair and give NYRP five minutes to do that in this section. So that's gonna be, who am I unmuting here? Uh, I'm unmuting. Corey Hassam. I've got two Corey Hassam, so I'm going to unmute you both. No, I'm just going to change you both to panelist. Did that work? And I if think we Corey have one. 
If the Corys Hassan could also rename themselves. Uh, sorry, I'm actually on both. I'm on my cell phone and my computers. I could do messaging, but. Um, I see. Um, so the other people to unmute would be Jason Smith, if you see him. Yep, Jason, I know him well. Yeah. And uh, Peter? Um, I think Jason will let you know the others. Definitely if Dr. Ann Tommy is there, she's, she's the other one. Or, or maybe the multiple Cam Beckers. Um, yeah, Cam uh, and we, we had um, a slightly longer presentation in mind, um, primarily not from MRP, but our, our partners at Pace University who, who did a project at Sherman Creek Park that we thought we should share with the community board. And, and it may make sense to postpone until we can uh, share the presentation okay. with, with like uh, slides that were prepared and have a little more time. I see, that would be fine. I only heard about this after we had already set our agenda. And if we had had a shorter agenda, I am always happy to add to it, but it's already a very long agenda. So I'm gonna take you up on your offer to come back in uh, September. Sounds great, Liz, thank you. You bet. So if you could do me a favor and email me directly, my, uh, the, my community board email that I use for this kind of thing is once again, L-I-Z-R-I-T-T-E-R dot C-B, the number 12, M at gmail.com. And y'all are welcome to stay on for the rest of the meeting, but if, if uh, I will not be at all offended if you decide you wanna bounce since the uh, item that you were planning on presenting on has been deferred to, um, uh, to September. Thank you so much. You bet, thank you. All right, um, Jennifer, so with that, we can segue into uh, whatever items you have to report in terms of programming and uh, capital update, etc. cetera. Sure. Um, first, I, I wanna make sure that everyone in attendance heard the news that uh, you know June is outdoors month and uh, June 4th is uh, National Trails Day and the Department of Interior um, designated nine trails nationwide as national recreation trails. Uh, included in that nine was uh, Inwood Hill Park's Orange Trail. Um, it's a 1.43 mile trail within uh, the 145 acre Chiraca Park Nature Reserve, Nature Preserve within the 196 acres of Inwood Hill Park. Uh, so I was out with AccuWeather today. Um, you can see it on their website. Uh, we got some national coverage for the trail designation which is something that we're really excited about. Most people on this call know uh, that Inwood is incredibly unique with its geological formation, its uh, sacred lands, the Lenape lands. Um, we've got um, ample active recreation, and then we have Manhattan's uh, oldest forest as well as the uh, thriving um, marsh. Um, so we're excited for this trail designation and the visibility and the recognition that it affords in Wood Hill Park. Um, and we're hoping we can use it to continue to build uh, the momentum we've gained in trail stewardship in Inwood Hill. Um, 750 native trees and shrubs been planted along the trails. We've got eight great trail stewards who are working alongside our storage division to tend to the trails, scout troops. Um, and behind a lot of it is obviously groups like Friends of Inwood Hill Park who have been tireless advocates. And so I don't know that she's on the call, but I just wanna give a huge shout out to Sally Fisher um, for being, for spearheading uh, that, that designation and, and uh, bringing parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy uh, alongside her uh, to get the NPS and the Department of Interior to, to give that designation. Um, some upcoming opportunities to, to work in the forest. Um, June 24th, there's a forest restoration project with the Parks Department Stewardship Division. 9 a.m. Um, we'll be meeting at Henshaw and Dykeman. Um, if forests aren't your thing and you want to help the playground, June 18th, um, Friends of uh, 
Inwood um, Friends of Indian Road Playground and, and local residents are working on a sand day um, at Indian Road Playground. Um, or you could do stewardship at Fort Tryon um, June 19th at 10 a.m. Um, and we'll be working on invasives removal then. If stewardship isn't your thing and you want arts um, or if you want fitness, uh, the City Parks Foundation is doing their city tennis program, just free instruction um, at Inwood Hill Park, uh, July 6th. It's hour long lessons for small groups, um, one to four in the time slot of one to 4 p.m. And you register on City Parks Foundation's website. Um, and for Tryon, there's free Tai Chi, forest fitness, meditation, and sunset yoga. You can find out more about that on fortryonparktrust.org. Um, and Nobles, am I allowed to say anything? Ah, up to the chair. Okay. Um, yeah. Nobles the, uh, is, is now a, a, also a member uh, of the Fort Tryon Park Trust Board. Um, so we're, we're yes. honored to have him working alongside us in the revitalization of that park. Um, one, la the last Scandia Symphony concert is happening in Fort Tryon Park this Sunday, so don't miss it, 2 p.m. on the Billings Lawn. Um, there's a lot more going on in the parks. That's just a sampling. You can find more out at northernmanhattanparks.org, click on events, or fortryonparktrust.org and uh, go to events. Um, announcement, like uh, some capital uh, project updates. Liz covered the Greenway um, retaining wall work um, that's going to be going forward, but after we hear more from state DOT. Um, again, I'm, I'm sorry Sally's not on this call. Uh, the Parks Department's Marine Operations Division is going to be having a, a, a a public meeting about the Inwood waterfront reconstruction. Um, as many of you know, it's a $22 million project. It's included in the Inwood rezoning points of agreement. Um, it's going to work on the, the waterfront infrastructure, some of the docks and piers in that area from Dykeman Street South to about um, the Inwood Canoe and Kayak Club. And that's planned uh, to be held at the Parks Department's Marina at 348 Dykeman Street. Um, June 23rd at 6 p.m. It's going to be outside at the marina. So mark your calendars. Um, I can circulate the, the flyer. Yeah, please to, do, uh, and we'll send it out. And, and what's the time on that? 6 p.m., June 23rd. Great. Okay. Um, did um, you have something you wanted to announce about um, park benches? Oh, right. Um, it's not a capital project. Um, you heard about a, a recent capital project uh, at Dykeman Farmhouse. We've been working with the Dykeman Farmhouse uh, given some growing public safety concerns. They've asked that we uh, remove the benches on 204th Street um, as sort of to pilot to see if that um, helps uh, dissuade um, some of the negative activity that um, has resulted in, in public safety challenges. So we'll be embarking on that in the next few days. Um, so we just wanted to make people aware of that. That's on 204th Street, um, the 204th Street uh, perimeter of the Dykeman Farmhouse. Mm -hmm. um, to be clear, the seats on Broadway will remain though. So it's not yes. like all the seating is going. Not all the seating's going, no, just a few yes. of the benches. Um, and, uh, I saw it, Bennett Park is a project that's already gone through the public input and public review processes. The public design commission has had its public hearings on it. That design will not uh, change. I, I saw that in the chat, somebody was saying they have better ideas from the synthetic. We're long past that process and the design is in procurement for reconstruction. So I just want to help manage expectations um, uh, related to that. In terms of tree guards at Bennett, I put in the chat, that's a city capital allocation. So you, I put a link in the chat how you can, um, you, what the process is for getting new tree guards. And alternatively, if you don't want to do it through city public funding, you can do it through um, uh, New York trees and your building can, uh, you know, ad adopt it. Uh, uh, a new tree guard location or new tree guard to be installed. 
Um, we've got 40 different capital projects. Nobody wants the details on all of them. So when, <laughs> so we're making lots of investment in the parks of town, which is really phenomenal. I think we have over $150 million, um, but I don't want to bore people with details. So if there are any specific questions, I'm happy to answer those. Is that helpful, Liz? Yes, there is one specific question. Uh, 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 the June 23rd meeting is about the waterfront stabilization project. I believe that is yes. Yes. Yeah, but it's okay. for the Dykeman Pier itself. One of the pier, the community pier dock that we're going to be putting in for the educational vessels at, you know, in the marina area, um, the shoreline south of the marina and the Inwood um, Boathouse dock. Great. Um, I just want to follow up on the, the bench removal thing. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not totally sure that that's going to be the most effective thing. Uh, I appreciate that Parks is committed to leaving the infrastructure for the benches in place so that if it turns out um, that that's not the way to go, it's, it's easy to replace them. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, Oftentimes we have uh, different competing needs around public use and around public safety and uh, variable impressions as to what's appropriate public use and what's not appropriate public use. And uh, one of the joys of living in a, in a community with many, many people is sometimes you try things, they don't work, you try other things. So I appreciate that this is not a... Um, a permanent solution. Uh, this is a trial to see if that's effective. So I think we'll continue to evaluate that. And if we have significant public feedback that it's not working, then we can change that, yes? Absolutely, yeah. Great. Um, okay, so next, um, if there are no other questions there, I would like to move the agenda. And actually, I hope it's okay with you, Marcus. I'm going to go next to um, uh, DCLA. So I just had a quick question for Jennifer. Yes. Okay. The, um, Jennifer, and this is, maybe I'm wrong, is I was looking up online for at, um, what's the one by me, High Bridge <laughs> Rec Center? And usually they have like dance, like the Zumba classes, but they didn't have a schedule. Are they on hold or something for a while? No, they're, they're, they're doing more and more, both inside the rec center and outside of it in the parks. Um, yeah, I didn't so see anything on, can, on the website. Did you look um, in the rec center page or did you look just yeah. Highbridge Park page? Well, both, okay. I was like confused. So I'll email you right. offline. Great. And link you up because with my, the rec center director. Thanks, because the five 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 old ladies club want to want to go down there and take some Zumba. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Um, all right. So next up, we've got. So we're moving item five to item four, and item four to item five. Got that, Nobles? All set. Okay, Deputy Commissioner. Good evening, everybody. It's good to be with you all. Listening to your conversation and your meeting reminded me of when I used to be on Manhattan Community Board 2, which I was on for eight years. So um, uh -huh. I am well aware of the local and hard work that you all do as volunteers to help uh, your neighborhood and your various communities. So I want to start off with that. I, I um, want. I actually, sorry, what? I just realized I didn't. I, I didn't queue up the right. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the right. Uh, this is what happens when I don't have all of my screens and my usual setup. I should have given you a better in introduction and a, and a better explanation as to why we invited you. Um, okay. It's um, you know it's it's a new mayoralty. It's a new commissioner. It's a new administration. Um, and I was very excited when our um, new councilwoman came a couple of months ago uh, to talk about sort of her vision and priorities for parks and culture. Uh, and I realized that um, 
because Zoom makes it really easy for people to drop in, uh, that it would be great if uh, DCLA could just come and talk a little bit about, again, your uh, vision and, uh, and goals for, uh, for your agency, particularly as they relate to Uptown. So no particular agenda or specific questions. And um, I just wanted to explain to people that's why we invited you. And we are delighted that, uh, that the agency was able to represent. Great, thank you for that. Um, so yes, as you point out, we are in a new administration. We have a new mayor, we have a new commissioner, uh, Lori Cumbo. I'm sure you've seen the articles. She has been with us since March of this year and she's hit the ground running. She is out every night, it seems right now, going to different cultural events around the city. And um, she has a long history of supporting the cultural sector uh, during her time, both as a council member, uh, representing uh, Fort Greene and other neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And then also uh, prior to that, starting her own museum. Um, so I think that's just something worth noting. In terms of the vision for the agency right now, I think the, the agency's vision continues on from what we had in the last administration, which is fundamentally to increase our, um, to increase equity uh, for our funding so that more groups are able to be eligible and can apply for funding through our uh, Cultural Development Fund, or CDF. Um, for those that are aware that have received funding in the past, that's a critical way that we fund many small community arts organizations throughout the city. We also have the Cultural Institutions Group, which I'm sure many of you are also aware of. Um, in Inwood, we don't have a CIG in Inwood. The closest I think we have is uh, Wave Hill in the South Bronx area, and then also, or in Riverdale area, I should say, and then also we have El Museo, a museum of the city of New York. Um, so that's not, I know it's not Inwood. I know we did work with you all, maybe not you personally, but we did work on some Inwood rezoning. Um, and, the, and as I think you were talking about the People's Theater Project. So we were a part of that as well. Um, and then for those of you that are not aware of the agency, I just wanted to toot our horn for a minute and just say that we are the largest municipal funder in the country. Um, last year, we had a record uh, $230 million that we gave out to cultural organizations through all five boroughs. This year, we had a tough budget fight, as I'm sure you saw last night, the but. The final budget was voted on and passed by the council. The handshake was earlier in the day and then the agreement was made last night. Vote took place and we did not fare quite as well, uh, but we did. We were able to secure an additional 40 million. So we have roughly a little over 200 million this year. Not quite the 230 that we like, but still largest municipal funder in the country. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Again, I think the great, the biggest piece I wanna say is that we are putting pieces into place to ensure greater equity in our funding, both on the expense side, which is the cultural development fund, and then also a little bit on our um, capital side with capital projects and having special programs to help smaller arts organizations access capital grants. So that's a little bit about DCLA right now. I'm not sure, Chair, if that addresses some of the questions that you had in mind, but I thought I'd start with that. Um, it, it, it does. Um, you know, as I said, I didn't have a particular agenda. So I guess my biggest question is um, we have a lot uh, in terms of arts uptown and cultural affairs uptown and um, a lot of artists who work downtown and live uptown, and then a lot of small cultural organizations, individual artists, uh, both fine and performing. And we're always looking for uh, all kinds of resources, whether it's funding or technical assistance or um, what have you. So I'm just wondering what's the best way for us to connect with DCLA around getting some of that 200, well, $200 million. 
Um, and what are, what do you think are the most effective ways for us to work with our elected officials to get more funding for DCLA? You know, over here in the Parks and Cultural Affairs Committee, we're very much 1% for parks, 1% for art kind of people. Um, Maggie, can you mute yourself, please? I don't know how to do that. Okay, I'll see if I can do that. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so we always, we always want more money for, uh, for that kind of programming. And, uh, and we agree, we want more money too for that kind of programming. Um, and so a couple of, piece, couple of inf pieces of information. So one, in terms of working with council members, you know, council members get what they call council initiatives, uh, anti-gun, um, coalitions of theater of color, SUCASA mm -hmm. and CASA and additional um, money to give out to specific, they get to designate cultural organizations. Um, so in terms of reaching out, if you're, an, if you're on this call and you represent an arts and organization or if you, Liz, wanna share this information, I would encourage people that have arts organizations, if they haven't already applied through the CDF, uh, process. They unfortunately missed it. The deadline was May 16th uh, to go to their council members now and see if they can uh, receive additional council funding through their council member. There's also member items that council members are able to give out. That's another way mm -hmm. to work with your council elected officials. Um, and then also even the borough presidents sometimes have a little money for yes. artists, uh, for arts organizations. For artists specifically, DCLA um, last year was able to do the City Artist Corps program, and that was only because we received federal funding to do so. This year, we were not receiving federal funding as a stimulus funding. So we partner with the local arts councils to help with getting money to artists themselves. So I would encourage artists to reach out to direct uh, local arts councils for that. Okay, we have Noma. Um, can you do me a favor and just sort of um, uh, tickle yourself for next year when the CDF grants go live so that we can, if you can send me that information um, so that we can use this committee as a vehicle for getting that word out there. Um, Cause I think there may be, you know, arts organizations that are not aware of it. Absolutely. And I think, uh, that's that's a great thing for us to keep in mind um, for next year. So thank you. We'll do that. Cool. Thank you. Um, so to my committee members, anybody else have uh, questions for Deputy Commissioner Feinberg? Going once, go up. Oh, I see a raised hand from Alexander Campos. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Great. Hi. I just want to go over. Yes. Uh, I know that, thank you so much for your presentation, Sheila. I just want to say that I'm Alex from the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, first of all, in Washington Heights. And the, I just want to say that the Community Board 12 oversees Inwood and Washington Heights. And I believe the Cloisters, which is in Inwood, is part of the Met, which is those kind of CIG. Mm -hmm. But there is no CIG in Washington Heights. Right. <laughs> so, right. That's no. like, so I just want to make that there's a distinction. So we're all one community board. There is Inwood and there's Washington Heights. And we are the largest organization in Washington Heights and we are not the same, which is fine, but just want to clarify that. Right, no, I didn't, yeah, I didn't. My recollection was that there were no CIGs in Upper Manhattan. So thank you for confirming that. Got it. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So um, as I said I just, to... Yes. Like, I just wanted to say it was so delightful to have Commissioner Combo at Drums Along the Hudson last mm -hmm. Sunday, participating in uh, the Sunday before last, participating in the powwow. It was fabulous. And she was so incredible and uh, talking about the, the rich riches we have in diversity uptown and throughout New York City and um we could really tell that she was just reveling in that the connectivity, uh, you know, through dance, through music, uh, through performance. And uh, it was really it was really wonderful to have her at Inwood Hill Park. So uh, please let her know. We, we really, really appreciated having her be a part of the 20th anniversary celebration. 
I will certainly do that. Um, she is, you know, she's got such great energy and I think she's a wonderful addition to the agency. And I think she's going to do great things uh, for culture and for DCLA. I just, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the Lenape land. And I wanted to say a personal, this is not, um, I'm not speaking as a deputy commissioner. I'm just speaking as a parent. Uh, my child was able to go up to Inwood uh, Park and explore mm. Lenape land and that's part of her curriculum where she goes to school. So um, I have a connection to it as well now through her. So wonderful. I just want to say that. <laughs> wonderful. So thank that's you. Great. That's really great. Um, well, thank you very much for coming. Um, I do have actually one question yes. uh, that if you could answer on the record, why, I will is, do my DC best. why is DCLA called mm -hmm. DCLA as opposed to DCA, which is department cultural affairs so uh i know the answer to this but i'm gonna let you answer it well i may not have the same answer as you no oh. my answer is that we were dca and then there was a department of consumer affairs and then we became dcla yep the l the l is sort of in there for culture cult and cult cult you know get the cultural yeah. in there so yeah. i think that's all it is Yep. So didn't mean to be overly jargony. Sorry for not, for, sorry for not calling that out earlier in the meeting. Um, but thank you again so, so, so much, Sheila, for coming. And you're welcome to stay on, but we will not be offended if you have other things you need to do with your evening. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm actually off to City Winery for a loser's lounge of Carol King hits. That sounds fantastic. I <laughs> wish I could join you. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank All you right. so much for having me. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Next up, we have at uh, 7.38, um, Marcus Book. You on the call, Marcus? Yes. Excellent. So good to see you. So uh, I, I just want to let people know that um, one of the joys of community board work is that um, issues don't always fall neatly into uh, one committee or another committee. Marcus Book uh, works for the MTA uh, New York City Transit. And so you'd think that he would be presenting at the Traffic and Transportation Committee, but this is a project that relates to um, use of parks land. So he's here to talk to us about a long-term project. Um, you know, what's the one thing we're always screaming about? accessibilities. We want accessible bathrooms. We want accessible museums. We want accessible um, institutions. We want accessible subways. So sometimes it takes a while for that to happen. And sometimes we have to give up a little something in order to get those accessible subways. So Marcus, what you got for us? Nope, you're muted. Wait, no, can't hear you. If it, if I may, if you can hear me, I'll step yeah. in for Marcus, who seems to be having uh, technical difficulties getting his voice across. Uh, my name is Matt Best. I'm chief engineer in MTA Construction and Development, and I'm going to be presenting the bulk of the material, so I can probably okay. give uh, the Marcus Marcus's uh, intro on this. Um, uh, Liz, as you as you stated, yes, this is this is a project that we're presenting to you guys rather than to the transportation committee because we're impacting Parkland in the construction, specifically Mitchell Square at where uh, St. Nicholas, Broadway, and 168th Street come together. Uh, our project will build a new elevator to the one train underneath Mitchell Square, completely underneath Mitchell Square. We have to go from the top. We can't do it all from below. So we're gonna have to close a section of Mitchell Square while we do it. And then we will restore what we, dis what we disturb and return it to public full public use. So I'll go over the details that kind of give you an overview of what we are doing at this station and, uh, and then what the impacts of the park will be as well. 
So I, I, I'm going to share my screen for a brief mm -hmm. presentation here. Yep. So hopefully you all can see it. Um, so what we're, what we're planning here, and hopefully all, you're all are familiar with the station. It is, again, at, at 168th Street, Broadway, St. Nicholas. It's where the AC uh, joins with the one. Uh, the one is very deep. And it is only accessible by elevators. Uh, you, if, for those who view the station, it, we just replaced all those elevators, and yet those elevators don't provide a step-free path to the platform. You still get off the elevators. So you have to take steps down to the elevators and then steps down to the platform from the elevators. So we're going to fix that, um, and we're going to we're going to do that uh, two ways. Uh, we're going to we're going to do it by um, taking these elevators. Um, and then providing another elevator to, to bring you bring you down to the uh, southbound Manhattan bound platform, uh, downtown platform. And then we're going to build a whole new bank of elevators on the other side of the station to get you down to the the inward bound platform from there. So mm -hmm. again, as you probably all know, it's a major transfer point. Um, it's it's not accessible to for people who need a step free path, and it is unusually deep. So those are our challenges. So I'm going to show you what it looks like in cross section, the station, and what our proposal is. So here, here you can see the existing, the existing elevators um, over here. They they land on a, a, on a mezzanine that requires you to go either across the bridge or down steps to the uh, to the southbound platform. There we're going to install an elevator to, that'll that will provide that step free path the rest of the way. But we can't use we can't get you up and over to the other platform uh, from this elevator, this, this landing. That's because it's, it's an arch tunnel and it's, it, to, to modify the arch, the arch uh, would, be, would require the one train to be shut down for an extended period of time. Um, so our proposal is to put another bank of large, of high capacity elevators on the other side of the station. So from there, you'll be able to go directly down to the, to the northbound platform um, or, or back up. Um, we'll also be adding a, a, a stair next to it, uh, which will not be open to the public, uh, but it will provide emergency egress. Uh, the station is a bit lacking in uh, a stair capacity in the case of an emergency. Now, the elevators are on emergency power, so they can be used also for emergency egress, but we, it, just, it will be a safety enhancement to have, also have an additional stair. Can I assume that those little, the, that the zigzaggy pattern of color indicates how many stories it is? Yeah, it's just about, yep. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, just a, it's just over 100 feet deep uh, from the street to, to where the, uh, the one train's running. We're also going to add an, another elevator on the west side of Broadway, uh, south of 168th Street, uh, right in front of the hospital. Uh, this station already has an elevator, which makes the mezzanine level accessible since the AC train is already accessible, but we felt it was very valuable to provide a second elevator for redundancy purposes. Also, Broadway and St. Nicholas are wide, and it's, it's, a, it's a long way to, to cross, and the hospital emergency room is on that side, so uh, it's, it's an important destination for those who, who need mm -hmm. accessibility. So. Uh, here's it. Here's a plan view of of what the station will look like at the mezzanine level. So, if, for those who are familiar, there's a narrow passageway which connects the one train over to the AC. We're going to build a, a passageway next to it. Uh, we assume the contractor will want to build a completely independent passageway. Maybe they'll want to widen it, but we think that'll be more difficult than just building a new passageway. But we need this for the additional capacity. Uh, since uh, we're, we're providing an additional route down to the platform, we expect more passengers to need to use this connection. Plus, it, it, frankly, it's, it's addressing what is a fairly unpleasant uh, transfer that, that currently exists between there. So and here you see those two new elevators that are going to go down to the northbound platform. Uh, here we are down at the lower level. Um, this is that intermediate mezzanine where the, the current bank of elevators ends. And you can see we're going to just cut in a new, smaller new elevator to get people who need that step-free path uh, down to the platform. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the station, we will be building this, this bank of elevators and then mining across to enter the tunnel at the level of the platform. This is why we are here with your committee. Uh, Mitch, both Mitchell Square and the Broadway Malls are parkland. And because we are... 
um, going to be encumbering the parkland with new below grade structure, the state law requires us to alienate it. So we were required to go to the legislature and ask them to pass legislation permitting the city of New York to remove the parkland from use. Now, the use that it will be is just whatever future use would require you to be more than four feet below the surface. We don't, the Parks Department doesn't anticipate ever needing anything that needs to be more than four feet below the surface. It may limit uh, the size tree that could be planted above our structure, um, but it, it really doesn't limit the use of, of Mitchell Square at this end of the park. All so right, I'm, a, I'm actually just gonna in, interrupt you just oh, please, in, please, the, yes. in the interest of, of real clarity. So yes. to be clear, because you know, I always my hair always stands up a little bit when I hear about alienating parkland. Mm -hmm. Sure. Be, if I'm understanding you correctly, once this project is done, and I imagine with all of this mining and whatever, it's probably going to take a while. But once it's done, the park, as we understand it, above ground will look pretty much the same as it does now. And what's being alienated is the below ground level which will have virtually no impact, if any impact at all, with the possible exception of, you know, oak trees are out. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, okay. in, in a swimming pool, uh, the Parks Park can't put a swimming pool at the end of, of Mitchell Square. That probably wasn't going to happen. No, exactly. Also, if I could just, um, can you send me this uh, slide deck? Yes. Because that's going to make it a lot easier when we yep. go to do the minutes. Absolutely. Marcus will, uh, will send it to you. Um, Thank you. At the end of end of our presentation, so we have two we have two areas of alienation. The blue is area that we are is the permanent encumbrance that we're we're we're, we're doing for for alienation purposes. So, and as I said, the Broadway malls are par, are mapped parkland, so we had to alienate the four feet below grade of the the Broadway malls as well. Um, and then, but the bigger impact is in Mitchell Square. The yellow is temporary impact. Um, so we can't just sit in the footprint that we're going to build. We have to have space on either side. And mm -hmm. state law requires alienation if you're going to occupy it for more than two years. And we def we anticipate we will need this land to construct this improvement for more than two years. So we prepared uh, a, a we, we prepared an alienation bill um, that described these areas. We, we sent surveyors out. They, they prepared the meets and bounds survey for this area. We found sponsors in the state legislature and they passed the alienation bill uh, in the, at the end of last session. So it was passed uh, at, the, at the very first week of June. Um, the legislation is awaiting uh, the governor's signature at this point. Who so, carried the bills? Um, I'm not sure I can look it up. I'm sure Marcus would be able to tell you immediately. It was your, it was your locals. It was the Senator and the assembly member who represent the area. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And then your council, your council member, uh, submitted a home rule resolution, which is required, um, since this legis state legislation only affected a single municipality and that passed as well. So. So when we're done, we're working. We've 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 been working hand in glove with the Parks Department um, as we work over the next couple of months putting together construction documents. The Parks Department will 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 work with us on the design of exactly how they want the park to look when it gets restored. Uh, a couple right. of things to a couple of things to point out. Um, I'll go back to our construction easement. Please note the war memorial. So that's kind of the the northern um, the northern landmark mark inside the park uh, that was outside our construction easement the parks department wanted it to be undisturbed and accessible for all time all, all times during construction so it is outside the limits of our construction easement and will be available to the public throughout okay uh what's the anticipated time frame for for this construction you said it's more than two years. ah here we go yep. next slide so uh, the project is in preliminary development right now. We had enough information to get the alienation bill passed, but now we're going to start getting more detailed uh, construction documents together. We expect to hire a design build contractor um, who will finish the design and start building in 2023. So this, this project will hopefully we start, um, you'll start seeing barricades going up probably towards the fall of 23 and they'll start work. 
We anticipate this will take four years. Um, it's going to be a lot of removing of rock. They just will be going down, chipping away uh, rock until they get down to the base. And that'll be the bulk of construction. So um, there will probably be transportation impacts. We're also working closely with, with DOT. I'm sure we'll go to, to get your the, uh, colleagues in the Transportation Commission Committee to talk about the transportation impacts that will happen during construction. We're going to need uh, area beyond the parkland that we were taking in order to, to stage materials to store rock to be taken away. Um, and then and, and we'll be there'll be quite a bit of additional community outreach as we start to develop the project further. Great. So, uh, that, so if that, yeah. is, that is the end of my presentation. So I'm, I'm happy to take uh, further questions. Yeah, I have a couple of questions uh, that have come in. Uh, from a member of the public. I'm just going to go through a synopsis of them. Uh, if you could talk about what emergency gives access to, what constitutes an emergency that gives access to the stairs? I assume that's if all of the elevators aren't working. Yep. Um, okay. And uh, what kind of venting is going to be there? Is there going to be any additional venting that's uh, going up through the park space, or this is simply subsurface use. Subsurface, okay. Subsurface use. Yeah, there will be no no penetrations other than what already exists in the park. Okay, and um, if and this might actually be a question more for Jennifer, but um, and I assume that parks will be working with you um, on the subsurface stuff to make sure that there aren't any negative impacts to existing trees. Um, but I'm just wondering if Jennifer could jump in with any thoughts, if she has them, about um, any impacts this might have on the trees that are already there or any cho cho choices that parks would be making uh, in the future. So I know that um, any project on park land goes through the parks interagency office. Um, and I guess, um, You've been working with Elizabeth, is it Koning? Yep, Elizabeth and Brendan. Um, so in terms of rest, have you, do you wanna talk a little bit ab about uh, mitigation and restitution? Yeah, we, we know we're gonna replace one tree um, okay. since there is a tree right above where, the, uh, where, the, where it is. So we, we, we presume that we will pay uh, appropriate forestry restitution for the tree that we remove. Um, as far as the the replacement of the parkland, we anticipate that we will we will make improvements to existing Mitchell Square, and if that's sufficient, um, that 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 will be the end of it. But if it's if it's deemed insufficient, then we'll, we'll, we'll we anticipate making improvements to other parks um, as for for to, as a condition of the alienation. But we think it'll all be contained in Mitchell Square. Um, obviously, since we're not taking any square footage of actual program space, we don't anticipate having to replace any parkland. Great. Uh, I got a question from Danny Bonilla. Danny, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, um, pretty cool presentation. And it's pretty awesome to see that uh, that, that station is going to get um, a new elevator. Uh, my question is, um, how, how intrusive is, is drilling going to be uh, around that area and would it affect any of the hospitals in that area? Well, that's going to be our, one of our primary um, outreach is to make sure that we are doing everything we can do what, while still permitting construction to, to proceed to not impact any of the adjacent property owners. It's the hospitals and, it's the, and there's a school adjacent. So we will probably have our restrictions on when we can work. Um, we'll do vibration monitoring. Um, the contractor will be required to keep 24-7 security on the site um, to make sure that the, the site is secure. I mean, there's going to be a 100-foot pit um, built in this site until we build everything back up. So um, we're, we, we take it very seriously. We take the community impacts very seriously. The contractor will be required to, to assure that there is no dust generated by his construction and as well as mitigating and keeping noise and vibrations to to an acceptable minimum. Hopefully, less than the the, the existing subway lines would create. Cool. I, I only ask that because uh, they're uh, they're doing construction across the street from my building, and I'm noticing that those 
uh, large drilling holes, they make a lot of vibrations. So uh, my concern would be is the hospital and the schools around the area, you know? Yeah, no, that, that, that is concern. There, there, there probably will be impacts. It's just, it's just the nature of the work. Um, everything's, everything's connected below grade and the rock's pretty shallow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, other questions? Um, uh, if the public has questions, please put them in the chat in the Q&A. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And as I said, if you could please uh, send me the slide deck uh, so that we can include that information. Great, we'll do. In our minutes. Um, uh, do you, uh, I assume since the, since the legislation has already gone through, you do not need a resolution from us. No. Okay. Uh, wait, I see. Okay, um, so Allegra, the reason this wasn't presented at the traffic meeting is this isn't fundamentally a traffic issue because it's not going into the roadway. As I explained at the beginning, it's going through parks because the issue is the alienation of parkland, uh, which has already been done by uh, legislative. Um, so thank you for that. All right, Liz, I appreciate Liz, I have one more question. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's really fast. Um, is yeah. the neighborhood being um, informed about this uh, construction happening? Are you guys putting up signs and stuff like that? Yeah, we will. We will make make it. We will probably need. We will probably be presenting to the full board at some point when we get closer to construction, and we will be we will be uh, doing doing full notifications that the work will be doing will be ongoing. Cool, cool, awesome, great. Thank you very much. Um, it was, uh, I appreciated hearing from you, Marcus. It was lovely to see you. Um, uh, I missed hearing your voice, but um, I guess we will hear from you at some point uh, in 2023 when we get a fuller presentation as to the specific impacts and timing of the beginning of this um, construction. And at that point, I imagine that actually will go through TNT because that's an operational thing, unless if you're coming to the full board, in which case not. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Okay, it is 7.59. Um, and next up we have, sorry, gotta look at my agenda. Really hate this phone and iPad thing. It's the uh, herb pack. Yep. Next up, we have uh, a double helping of Fernando Ortiz. Um, first, uh, so Fernando, are you here? Hello. Yes, hey. I'm here. I've so, been here since 6.30 watching all of these great presentations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So I don't know if PTP is on yet. If they're not, you are welcome yes. to do the Greenway presentation first. Yes. If they I'm are, here, I'm can... here. Okay, great. Yeah, Nino. so we can do ours. <laughs> Nino is here, and I'm joined. There's another Fernando Ortiz in the crowd, um, who's um, my colleague, Emma. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I just want to, I, I just want to, by way of an in, in, uh, introduction and queuing you up, as we actually heard, uh, somebody's got some background noise, if we could mute. Nino, I think you have to uh, so as we heard, uh, Sheila Feinberg uh, did mention the Inwood rezoning. Um, the ERPAC is part of is part of the Inwood rezoning and is something that uh, the community board had been calling on for quite some time. So we are thrilled to have some more information and specifics about what exactly that is going to look like. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to hear more. Perfect. Um, quick question. I sent yes. over the slides. Do you want me to share my screen or? If you could share your screen Perfect. would be great because it's just, it's, 
it's more than I can handle on my on my iPad because I'm just stupid like that. And I have the PowerPoint up. I can just throw it up. Oh, perfect, Emma. Yeah. That'd be great. We have a quick little video in there, so the PDF won't won't show that. Perfect. That's yeah, super helpful. Second. And just to kind of um, introduce ourselves, I my name is Fernando Ortiz. I am an assistant vice president for government and community relations at EDC. Um, and I manage the Bronx and Upper Manhattan, which is everything. Up. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague Emma today um, and by Mino, who represents the People's Theaters Project. And I'll let them quickly introduce themselves. Um, but we're here to present on ERPAC, which stands for the Immigrant Research and Performing Arts Center. And just full disclosure, the name is subject to change. It was just for the purposes of having a name, um, but um, yes, we, so Emma and uh, Mino, do you wanna quickly introduce yourself? Sure, I can go quickly. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen and somehow you all have disappeared from my screen once I have the slides up, but hi everyone, I'm Emma. I'm also at EDC and I'm on the real estate transactions team. i um, been working on her pack for, going on a year now. So excited to be here, um, tell you more about it. And hello everyone. Um, my name is Mino Lot. Happy to be here. Sorry, my daughter just had her dance recital talking about culture. Um, and I'm the founding executive director of People's Theater Project. Great. So with that, I'll kick us off. We have a few slides to run through today um, just to give you an overview of ERPAC, which EDC has been working on for about three years in total now. And um, we're all really excited that as we assume you all have likely heard, we have selected People's Theater Project to be the future owner and operator of the, of the space. And here on the right-hand side of the screen is just a little screen grab of the top of the press release that we um, released, uh, I think last month, if not the month before. So before diving into PTP's wonderful vision for the ERPAC space, which will be located in Inwood, we wanted to just give you a quick overview of the history on the project. So if I can go, there we go. So ERPAC originated as a POA commitment from the Inwood NYC planning initiative, where during that planning process, EDC and the city really heard such a strong desire from the local community that um, there was a desire to have a space delivered for cultural organizations. So therefore such a commitment was included in the POA letter. And at EDC, we've been dedicated really since the get-go to this commitment and actually making this project a reality. So what that means for us is issuing an RFEI and going through that whole procurement process to procure the operator for the ERPAC cultural facility and also on the city side committing up to $15 million in city capital which is obviously really important and really needed. And that will go to the design construction acquisition of the facility. And then furthermore, committing $75,000 in technical assistance. Um, that is for capacity building for the future operator, which now we know is PTP. So in our efforts to fulfill all these various commitments to the community, we issued the ERPEC R. RFEI, lots of acronyms, in September of 2019 in conjunction with DCLA. So it's great um, that DCLA was on here earlier and subsequently selected and announced PTP as the future owner and operator of the space. Um, and right now, EDC's main role is to draft, negotiate, and review various transaction documents that will facilitate that transfer of funds uh, from the city to PTP. So with that, I will pass it over to Mino who will uh, walk through the vision for the space and um, show some images. Um, hello again. Um, can everyone see those slides normal is it, or great it's yeah. just my eyes great because I, I can't see anything for some reason it looks completely blurry 
I hope I'm not going blind. Uh, you're I think getting old, you know, you're getting old. <laughs> I totally am, Liz. I totally am. Um, but I don't need this. I know who we are. Um, so we are People's Theater Project. Um, we're a theater and social justice organization working with and for the immigrant community, creating theater with our neighbors. We've been around for um, over 13 years in Washington Heights and Inwood. Um, we have three main pillars of our program. We have our PTP Academy for Theater Leadership and Activism. Um, we have our partnerships with 19 uh, local public schools in Washington Heights, Inwood and the Bronx. Um, and then we also have our professional ensemble. This is the PTP company comprised of immigrant artists of color. Um, and we create work at the intersections of arts and social justice, right? So we have been um, addressing issues that impact our communities um, for many years. We've partnered with city agencies, with Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, with the DA's Office to address immigrant fraud, fraud against seniors. Um, and we, you know, together with, uh, I think we had 21 letters of support from local organizations and groups and artists and CBOs um, from grassroots, from the smallest grassroots uh, uh, arts organizations to, you know, social service organizations like NIMIC, Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporations, applying for this proposal. Um, and we are just thrilled uh, for this, um, for what this will mean for our community. Um, this has been a, um, a dream, uh, a, a hope and that Liz Ritter knows more than me because she's been fighting for it for many years, even before the 15 years that we've been around, you know, really advocating for this. And this will be a home for the programs of People's Theater Project, but for so much more. This is a home for the community. Um, this will be a place, an incubator for new works uptown, um, for immigrant artists and, you know, the research, it has that R there. And as Fernando said, we will be going through a public process uh, with our community um, over the summer, over the fall, to really get input of what this name should be, right? And we started some of that community engagement process already. We will be presenting a video of what that first kind of presentation of where we are in the process with the design, with our team, um, since we've been selected. We've had to move very fast um, uh, in order to do that. So if we can move forward, I don't know if I'm missing any of the key points here, but move forward in some of the images. Yeah, so right now, you know, if you can't see the screen. I see, I see that one. Thank okay, you. great. <laughs> so we wanted to show kind of a, a an overview, right, of where we're at now. Um, so this will be part of a project that will be developed on 407 West 206th Street. Um, and it doesn't mean that these are the colors, but the idea is this is the frontage of it, right? So it, it's pretty wide. We're about... We don't know the exact number, but it's about 19,000, 17 to 19,000 square feet. Um, the space will have a lobby cafe. Um, it will have uh, five rehearsal studios in addition to practice rooms, because we know there's individual artists, musicians, opera singers um, who need a practice room that is soundproof, podcasters, right? So that'll be there. Um, one of the studios will be a um, more for visual artists um, or for groups like, uh, um, you know, storyteller, uh, writing up to stories, for example. Um, and then the others are for performing arts, right? It can be for dancers, it can be for theater uh, makers as well. Um, and then we will have two performance spaces, which is very exciting. One is a flexible performance space from 99 seats to 200 seats, um, all configurations, mostly proscenium and thrust, you know, three quarters uh, audience and three sides. Um, but it could be in the round, right? We wanted to make sure that it could fit every need that is, you know, that that is needed, right? That people would want. It can be in the round, it can be thrust, it will have a balcony space as well. It can also be for graduations and for galas. Um, it can be town halls, right? So, you know, as I said that we've been in that intersection, we want this to really be also an organizing space, right? Um, so that we want, you know, if there's organizing meetings, if elected officials want something to say, the commissioner wants to come and address uh, the community board needs to have another space for meetings, this will be that space as well. We will also have a second performance space. So one of the studios where you say where you see that it says S4, we're looking to see if we can have a direct access to the to the street in that space. So it can also serve as a 45 to 50 uh, seat uh, theater. Um, so a smaller stage and a smaller audience. Um, and we're very excited about making that available too. So it'll be two different performance spaces. And this is a kind of a bird's eye view um, and it's you know floor plan not, but I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit. So we are on the street level and the cellar level. Um, so there is street access, every single space in the theater and in the cultural center is accessible, accessible, 
um, for all different mobilities, all different physical abilities uh, for our community. That's important to us because we envision having senior programming here, having youth programming here, having access to strollers. So the entrance, because we know and love our uptown community, it's very hilly. Every street goes like this. Um, so right when you enter, you will have ramps that take you to the lobby, and that's what you see as lines. Um, right now, where you see purple, yellow, orange, and red. Those are those studios that I was talking about. Um, and then where you see white with the X, that's the double height ceiling. Because in order to go to the main performance space, because it's double height, you go down those steps or you take an elevator. On the pink, on the left and the top, those are the administrative offices uh, for people's theater projects. And then the back of gray is the shop uh, for prop, for, for uh, sets, to be able to build sets, to be able to store sets, um, chairs, like all the storage needs. Uh, there's also a second storage downstairs. So the blue in the first floor is the lobby. And then when you go down the stairs, it's the extension of that lobby. And that's where you will enter the main stage. There will be various entrances because depending on the configuration, you will need to use more than one entrance. And this is not the final one where now that hallway extends, you can go all around. The light green is dressing rooms and green rooms. Again, that format has changed a little bit, but that's the same location. And then the purple in the bottom is that other studio. So we're playing with like, how can it open up and really expand, but that'll be another performance um, another rehearsal studio that will be available for um, for the community for rent as well. If you go to the next slide. Great. So this is the the video um, of the event that we did recently at Alianza Dominicana, and I'll, we can just let it play. Let me know if you all can't hear the sound. You should do it. We have artists uptown that are extremely talented, who don't have the space, who don't have the resources, who don't have the tools within our own community. And this center is finally going to come through to provide all of that. Uptown, Wash Heights, and what it really needs is what we deserve, a space where we can be ourselves. PTP is like the people to do it. They're about us, they're about the community, they've been doing the work. It feels amazing to see that the work is translating but to the entirety of the community. The idea of having an actual building for our immigrant community of color and have it be our vibrant, beautiful, brave selves makes me just so happy. We have to find space all the time. So the idea of having a dedicated theater space in Inwood is really, really exciting. I'm looking forward to some more theater action. Um, you know, going to the theater is something that we haven't been able to do. We already do so much in such a small space. Just, I can't even imagine the amount of creativity and expression that's going to be in an entire building. They can feel the nostalgia the moment they enter in. Like, hey, this is just like how we do it where I live, where I come from. Hey, we do that too. This is the beginning of this phase. Um, it's the middle of what they've been doing for so many years, and it's the beginning of something wonderful. We are just so thrilled that the advocacy of so many artists and community members and families for decades, immigrantes and Latinos, You recognize some faces there, I'm sure. Mary Anderson, Liz Ritter, Led Black, so many wonderful uptown heroes. Um, a, great, so we can go to the next slide. Some of those quick images um, was, uh, we were showing the first, I, the first kind of ideas of the space, right? The design, the architects gave us this, and this is a immigrant women uh, led architecture firm, which was important to us. Um, so this is that lower lobby that I spoke about, right? So you come in through the top and just envision going down those steps and that open space, right? Double height ceiling. So what we will be working, Noma is one of, you know, in the proposal, we named them as one of the, one of those resident companies. They'll be helping us with who are the artists and we're really playing with, because we have that big wall. So what does that look like and how can it change, right? If the theme this year for the season, um, we're focused on artists from, a Guatemala, you know, what are Guatemalan artists who can be there or uh, what cultures can be represented what, or thematically, right? It's, you know, we're addressing anti-blackness <laughs> this season and how are we representing that in the mural? So we're talking about like it really could be a curated space 
as well, not just a mural that goes up once and never comes back again. Um, Cause really we want it to be a, a space that continues to live. Um, can go to the next slide. Um, this is, imagine that you're standing on 206th street and it's a big glass wall. This is what you're seeing, right? So that connection from street to inside is so important to us. And I love that they put some plants there because I love my plants. So I love plants. I love greenery. Um, and you see the ramps. It's really, I love that the architects created the term rampatorium, right? How is every space going to have culture in it? This is drag queen story hour. This is open mics with Word Up Bookshop, right? This is um, author series right there. Right when you enter, there are these ramps that can have seating areas. This is when the kids do homework, right? Before going to classes. Um, so this is really an exciting space and you see the cafe from there. You can kind of see the mural all the way that will take you down and to the right a little bit is the box office. And one thing also to say here is, again, that accessibility, um, these ramps are playful but they're also like, everyone will use the ramps, whether you need a ramp or not. <laughs> this is just the way we enter into this space, which is very exciting to us. Next slide. Um, this is another view of the same thing and something to point out here, again, because of the elevation. If you see on the top right of the screen, there's a little person carrying, there's someone carrying a little person coming in and there's kind of a glass wall. Something that is, it was a challenge that we had to work with in the spaces. You know, the theater is down there and some people who are, you know, who may be here who produce theater are like, how are we getting sets? How are we getting, you know, things down there? So we had to figure out, we first had like this big freight elevator right in the entrance, but it was taking away so much light. These are the only windows we have right in the front. So you see those three steps. There's a person sitting there. It's like a little platform that'll serve for a trio, you know, string beans and, you know, quartet, um, whatever it may be there, but it opens up like this, kind of like the sidewalks, you know, in front of restaurants and it becomes a lift. So you can put everything in, it comes from the street, goes there and boop, comes down. So it was a great effective way whenever there is load in that it can be used, but also it doesn't have to be present and take away space. So we thought that was a very clever way to do that. So that's a cafe on the left, the box office on the right. And then that, if you keep going straight in between, that's where the classrooms, the studio spaces are. Next. This is just a view of one of the studio spaces and, you know, being in use and, the, you know, kind of seeing it when you walk by, like our vision is like, there's all these things happening, right? There's puppet theater happening on one side and young people creating things and dancing on the other side and, you know, really cool theater happening. Um, next. This is the small performance space, right? Again, these very initial ideas, but you see the windows are on the back. We're playing with the idea of uh, an entrance directly from back there and then the performance space in the front um, and figuring out where the booth will be. But the idea is this is a smaller venue. So if it's a, a develop, a, a process, uh, say something in development, right? This can maybe a good seat for it rather than a 150 seat theater. Um, or if you're having a longer run, you may want a 45 seat house or 50 seat house if you're doing a two or three week run. So, or a smaller or a one person show. Um, so these are some examples of one of the performance spaces. And then the next one, this is the initial idea of that second one. So this is the mm -hmm. thrust configuration. So you see audiences on, on three sides, um, a balcony space, there'll be a full, the little window on top is the, um, the tech booth. And there are entrances, there's four different, here you only see one, but there's actually sound and light locks on both corners there and on the right side and the left side on this side as well. Next. So just to conclude um, with a quick timeline here, um, the project is of the base building has already started uh, construction on that this spring. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the city issued the public press release announcement um, also this spring announcing PTP is the future owner and operator of the ERPAC space. There's approximately a three year construction timeframe of the base building followed by approximately 12 months of fit out of the theater space that Nino just presented. Um, so by late 2026, early 2027, um, there will be the delivery of the fully fit out or pack uh, community and cultural center theater space to PTP and the opening of that space. So 
with that, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm gonna jump in with a couple of questions. Uh, one that I have um, and two that came in on the chat uh, and one clarifying point just for people who haven't already sort of put that together for themselves. We are talking about the space that used to have a path mark on it. So it's the space um, just east of uh, um, ninth, it's between 9th and 10th avenues um, where the path mark used to be and which was you know, a, a, a community pool decades prior to that um, for the old time Inwood crowd who lived here in the 50s or 60s and still remembers that. Um, so, I'm curious, and you may not know this yet, Mino, if you can talk a little bit about what is it, what's going to be the selection process for, you know, people who want to use the space? What do the rates look like? How is that all going to be managed? Uh, and the other two questions that came up in the chat, and you addressed this a little bit, Mino, is, um, uh, you know, define immigrants. Is it all immigrants of just one group um, or is it a variety of immigrant groups and how do we ensure representation there? Um, and in terms of people's theater projects, um, the work that PTP does with public schools, if you could just tell us a little bit about which public schools you're in and the extent to which you're working through the District 6 um, parent list serve to you know, get the word out about your programming. Great. Um, the first one was Liz. Oh, yes. The, the, how do you, the business plan. And so one of the things, as Emma mentioned, um, the DCLA is going to give us uh, funding for capacity building. One of the things that we'll be doing is a business plan. Um, this means we'll know, I have no idea what the rates are. I want everything to be free. People's Theater Project, all of our programs are free. Uh, we believe art is a human right. But I also know <laughs> that ongoing funding does not come with this. Um, and you have to turn on lights. And as I've learned already, building a theater is extremely expensive. We will be doing a capital campaign to build up reserves for the first few years. Um, and I'm already in conversations with the congressman and the, uh, the, our council member, Carmen de la Rosa, about how could we have ongoing support from the city or from government so that it can help subsidize for the community, right? And we want to make it how it will happen, already in conversations with our artistic director who had a baby a week ago, so she's not here, um, a, about like, literally it's a meeting around a table. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this year, who wants space? And let's put it in a calendar. People's theater, probably, we plan our seasons a year in advance. So for us, it is important that we need to know, so how many, um, there's gonna be space that will be for community members and we'll see what that rate is. Also having conversations with NOMA. NOMA used to do grants and they're starting that already. Like, could there be specific space grants that they can be giving? That happens in other parts of the city. Could that happen as well? So we're looking at, you know, resident companies, what that could be, um, what that means for space, as well as, um, you know, partners. Uh, so we'll look at, and all of that will come in that model with the business plan of what it'll mean to run a space. PCP hasn't done that. We've been at 5030 Broadway. We've had one studio. Um, we're going to be at the Noma studios this coming year. So we are going to be learning, but for us, I mean, I think the community just to know that is extremely important for us, that it is accessible. We've been partnering with so many groups for so many years and we'll make that a priority and I'll find the money to make sure that it can happen. Cool. So, I mean, I just, I know that we certainly have the anthropologist, Up Theater Company, and Inwood Artworks that are already uh, doing a lot of this kind of work. And I know that you're already working with all three of those. Yeah. Um, and I would encourage you to use, um, you know, this committee, the community yes. board in general, um, and to just kind of keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so let me just look and see what, what we've got. So hands raised. Um, Danny? Got uh, from the committee, we've got Danny Bonilla and Barbara Fraser. 
So oh, and let me answer the other. Should I answer the other two questions? Yeah. Can I go to questions? Yes. So the yeah. other one is about how do we define immigrant? Um, so I am an, you know, an immigrant from Dominican Republic, uh, and I am the, you know, the founding executive director. So when People's Theater Project started, it was predominantly Dominican, obviously, since I started it. Um, and we are uptown, right? Um, but it's we, as an immigrant-centered organization, have really delved into that, right? And we started our first, you know, one of the first shows we did was um, a, with our PTP company four years ago, when we started this branch of the organization was Las Mariposas around uh, the immigrant experience, specifically Latin American women. Um, and we've continued to go into, okay, well, what does it mean to be immigrant and how do we represent the immigrant community and taking that upon us as an organization. So right now our PTP company and our staff represents so many countries. Our artistic director is Greek and Mexican. Um, and our company has actors from Uganda, Nigeria, Korea, Japan, um, uh, Iran, um, uh, Chile. Um, and Mexico. So it, it just even the conversations are so powerful. When you hear, when you see a piece of PTP, it's multilingual. And we want to continue to grow even more of that, right? Uh, New York City is so diverse. We are an immigrant city. And we want so many of those voices to be represented on the stage, not only through people's theater project productions, but through the companies that come, the organizations who come and beyond. And then Thank the last you. one was our partnerships. We started in schools at Harbor Heights Middle School and 172nd on Fort Washington and 173rd. Um, and I can definitely give a list of the 19 schools. I don't, you know, our education director knows them better than me, but we are, we've been at Amistad Dual Language School. We currently, we've been in almost every school in District 6 um, <laughs> over the years. Um, right now we're at George Washington High School in one of the schools, I think it's the third floor. Um, we're in Marble Hill. Um, we are at, um, I, I will get you the list, <laughs> um, I but we are in that. many schools and I will get that too. And I we work closely that. with district six and Manny, Manny's office as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Danny followed by Barbara, followed by Maggie Clark. Cool. I'll keep my questions super, super simple. Um, Pretty awesome presentation. Uh, I am an artist. I love seeing stuff like this. Um, and it's pretty cool to continue uh, teaching like the youth about just any kind of like arts, uh, theaters and, and whatnot. Uh, one of my first questions, like super innocent is like the, the space that you guys have, uh, the, decor the, the, the decor of the space, uh, you said something about murals. Would you have uh, artists or people in the actual neighborhood uh, come up with ideas to 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 represent the actual neighborhood um, instead of like having like oh like we're gonna get this guy from LA to come out over here oh my gosh and yes paint, and paint this mural because that's one of my biggest pet peeves <sighs> is that when 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 there's like oh we have a community space uh, we want to make it beautiful but we're gonna have to like let's call this guy from from like 3,000 miles away that doesn't know nothing about the community, might be able to relate, but it's like never a local person, you know? Yeah, that is so important. And we've actually worked with local artists uh, a couple of times, one at Amistad, we were at Amistad last year, that's where my kids are, I'm the PT, proud PTA co-president there. Um, and we did, we worked with a local artist to do a mural so you can stop by and see it. Um, so it's absolutely, we've worked with Dister in the past. Um, we worked with um, uh, Reinaldo Pantaleon, which probably many of you know. Um, we've worked with a few artists and it's so important. So yes, we will go to the community to get the ideas from the community, to hire from the community. This is also work Force, right? I think this is an exciting model for the country of how do how do you support communities and cities in recovery by supporting arts and centering communities of color and centering immigrant communities specifically um, around that recovery. So I'm very excited. It'll be a priority for us um, to be working locally with artists um, and to be getting that input from local artists 100%. And it is my pet peeve too. We don't need it. And that was actually one of the reasons that we applied because we were like, can we do this? But we're like, if we don't, because <laughs> all of our organizations, you know, when we had so many meetings with local groups, we're like, then somebody else from outside work is going to come and do this. And we need to do it ourselves. We need to show up. So 
absolutely stay in touch with Mino at peoplespeederproject.org or DM me or go to our website. And yes, 100%. All right. And uh, uh, another question. Um, and before I even ask, ask the other question, I think you're a real one for saying that. So I appreciate that answer. Um, <laughs> see. And, and, and I, I'm actually working with this on a project right now. So Yay, he's, love he's this. my guy. He's my guy. Yes. Um, the next question is, uh, will, would there be any free programs uh, for kids in the area? Uh, we definitely live in a neighborhood that, that there's a lot of families that can't afford um, just extra programming and all that stuff. Yes. I'm just going to uh, jump in here and say all of PTP's programming is free. And yeah, it always I, has been. Always has I, been, always will be. I, news to me. Yes. So ptp.nyc, we have Saturday programs for K through fifth grade, um, semester long. And then we have our Academy for Theater Leadership and Activism for sixth through 12th grade, once a week, a multi-year training program and completely free. We never charge. So, so just not, not, not veering off of that question that often, that, that, that far, but uh, let's say if I'm, a, if I'm a small theater company and I want to do like a small play, like, what does that look like? Like, and I don't have much money. Can I go, hey, can I use this space for like one day? Uh, even if it, like, I can't, like, let's say I can't do a year in advance. Like, what happens if I just have like a play for next one? Yeah. And that's like what we will figure out because we know that sometimes it's, we, you know, we're able to plan a year in advance, but we mm -hmm. will leave space for those that'll come one off of one night and we'll figure out what that will look like. That's where I'm working with elected officials. Um, that's where once we do the business lines, you see what that is. But we mm -hmm. understand um, that things will come up. The needs are different. We will create space so that those can happen. And again, I would encourage you to work also um, with the community board. These are public meetings. Our minutes are public. And, um, you know, if you are coming and it doesn't have to be you necessarily, but it should be um, someone from PTP. It doesn't have to be every month. But I think part of the reason why this committee has been not a perfect vehicle, but a good vehicle for the you know, cross fertilization of different groups is we have a lot of our institutions coming, not to every meeting, but periodically to meetings. So we're, you know, we're hearing from uh, the Hispanic Society, from the Morris Jamel Mansion, the Dykeman Farmhouse, from Noma, from the Cabrini Shrine, whatever of what they're doing in their various organizations. Um, you know, nobody has the time to go to every meeting every month, but if we have uh, folks from PTP dropping in, you know, on a regular basis, that's going to really enhance the cross fertilization, the awareness uh, can, and increasing awareness of your programming, but also the opportunities for cross fertilization um, in whether it's uh, art galleries, using the space, uh, what have you. Yes, 100%. Um, Barbara. Uh, when uh, Udonis and I had discussed this a couple of years ago when, the, you know, when these ideas first floated, part of the uh, immigrant uh, center there was also similar to the Schomburg to have a um, research center that would focus similar to the Schomburg on immigrant life in New York uh, uh, for study and so forth. And I don't quite see that there. That's gonna be, that. I'm actually gonna jump in and address that. That's part of, in that slide much earlier uh, that we saw from EDC, that's where the New York Public Library is uh, going to be focused on. That's not going to be part of what, um, what uh, PTP is responsible for in terms of that programming, that's going to come through the New York Public Library. But that will be at the site. Yeah, so, and we, yes. you know, we will be having conversations. The idea is that you go in there, you'll learn about immigrant cultures, and but we yeah. will be working with them. It'll be more programmatic, right? So you're not going to go and go to a library, but there'll be a presence of NYPL, and we're, we'll figure out, like, exactly what that is through author series, through specific, like, um, curated documents around specific immigrant communities that you can find there. Like if you've been to the signature theater, there's like a library section, like in the lobby, like what does that look like? But there will be that component and NYPL will be handling that. Yeah, right. the, other, but the other question I had was, um, 
in terms of the outreach that you have for the schools, are you also reaching out to the charter schools, the independent daycares for the, like your puppet projects, uh, the charter schools, the Catholic schools and such, and including them in the initiatives? Because we do have a very rich, you know, several other layers of education in the district. Yeah, we are in a, uh, in a, we've worked at school in the square. We're a charter high school for law and social justice. We've worked at, mm -hmm. we worked at, yeah. So we definitely have a relationship with like most of the schools in the district. Um, and I did get the list, um, a list so I can send it to you. We, we haven't done too many partnerships with um, early childhood because we work with K and up, but we go okay. to all every school and let them know about our programs. Um, oh, okay. Sure. So, and we also work with, CBO, so we work with Threat mm -hmm. sure. Initiative as their art subcontractor, as well as um, the Y on Nagel. Okay, and then the first third question I had was in terms of in residence, we have some very long established and you know very uh, treasured companies like Pied Piper or yeah. Input. And they're Arts. also they were also one of our letters of support. Yeah, exactly. And but um, I saw you have like administrative offices for for pe people's theater. Uh, will they also have some kind of administrative presence there? Because I know P Pied Piper has been kind of vagabond, you know, for the last couple of years and such. Will they also have like an administ? Is it possible that these other longtime established arts groups here in the neighborhood will also have an administrative office and permanent presence here in the arts center? Yeah, not administrative space. There isn't enough administrative space for um, to be able to offer um, offices to others. There will be like the conference room will make that available. Uh, but there will be the idea is that, you know, we have been in communication with Pipe Piper as well. Like, they're like, we need a space to do our shows twice a year, yes. our productions. Yes. And it's like, they can count on that. <laughs> and well, 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 count on that. Yeah, yeah that, um, I'm well, sorry, Barbara, Barbara, I really need to move. The, I really need to move the agenda. So I'm going to I'm going to defer. Well, questions will they get like storage space for props and things like that no unfortunately we're we're negotiating with the developer to get more storage let's <laughs> make sure that there is right yeah. now um i yeah. do i do also want to say that while i appreciate your concern for um pied piper theater company they are actually doing okay now um housed at the nagel avenue y so, well, I'm just bringing up a theoretically good mm -hmm. established groups, not them particularly, but good established groups. Yeah. If they would also have storage space, conference space, and so forth, they have a foothold also in the center. Yeah, that's just my point. But I don't think there will be enough space for otherwise. I mean, yes, to conference rooms and the cafe, we hope can be a place where people work. And many of the local groups are volunteer run. So they every, mostly people have jobs and then they do this on the side at PTV, mm -hmm. you know. At ten staff members full time, right? So we okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So just in terms of managing expectations for the rest of this meeting, it is eight thirty eight. We've got a couple of more hands up, and then I want to wrap up this uh, section of the agenda so that Fernando can present to us on the Greenway. It is my fervent wish to end this meeting by nine or as close to it as possible for many reasons, including I have not yet eaten and my blood sugar is getting low. So. Uh, I'm going to uh, take the remaining questions that we have, which is uh, Maggie Clark, followed by uh, Mel S. Um, and then uh, Jamirna gets the last word. Maggie. It's good to hear about this. Uh, it's the first time I'm hearing about this. Uh, I, I don't know how I managed to miss all the planning sessions because uh, I thought I was pretty well plugged into what goes on here. Uh, you know, we've had a performance space available at the Ring Garden for 38 years, but not too many people come and want to perform. And so that's that's an issue that uh, I was hoping um, could be brought at least to people's consciousness in this meeting. But my question about this um, this this uh, pack is um, you know I'm a performer and an artist as well, and I've got a band. We can't find any place to play up here. Uh, we go down to the East Village, to Brooklyn, to the Busk in the Park. Uh, we're in need of uh, direction and education on how to market ourselves. I consider myself a member of the community, but I don't see myself as being welcome in this space. 
Is that wrong? In or is that incorrect? In, in, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Maggie. And um, this is a space for everyone. And I think, you know, our, our hope is that, you know, we come here, whether we're immigrants or not, to create a more compassionate community, right? It's an inclusive space of all of us, because whether you're an immigrant or not, you know immigrants. You were descendants of immigrants. You've been surrounded by immigrants. Your bodega owner is an immigrant. So this is about how do we understand each other's stories? How do we come closer together? So you are very much welcome into this space. And I hope you come and perform at your space and also busk, I love buskers. Um, but this is what this space is about, right? And it's like, let's see how many members your space has. Is it in the Rampatorium? Is it in the lobby? Is it in the small studio? Is it a one night? Is it an ongoing series, right? Where we have local, bands perform right we did make sure we're working with acquisitions and you know theater designers so it can meet different needs even the larger space so because if it's uh, you know inwood artworks we know has a film festival right that's a different acoustic need than live theater it's a different acoustic need than a band right um so we are thinking of all of these things and this is a place for all of us thank you thank you thank you for that question thank you for that answer and i'm just going to put in my two cents that i would love to hear uh maggie either as a solo gig or with the needles play because she and they are fantastic Amazing. Um, so like kind of awesome um mel i had mel s who had a hand up but now doesn't have a hand up so Mel S, you're next. If you have something you wanted to ask or say, going once, going twice. Okay, uh, our uh, committee member Jumirna Alcobar gets the last word. Thank you, Liz. Thank um, you. I wanna start off by saying thank you, Mino Lora, for being here. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little groupy, but um, <laughs> it is what it is. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, so I have two questions. Within that space, would there be, I don't know if you got to touch up on this, um, would there be youth-based opportunities, let's say maybe um, internships or open to summer youth in the summertime, or you paid internships or part-time specifically catered to our young uh, demographics in the community. And my second question, and it seems like you're gonna tell me yes to that question because I saw you nodding. And the second question would be, um, would this space be open to collaborate with other nonprofits organizations of District 6 in specific? And I say this because I currently work for a nonprofit organization out of A. Philip Randolph High School called Sound Business Inc. With over 30 years servicing um, A. Philip Randolph Campus High School students. Although we are on 135th Street, Harlem, our school is part of District 6. And also, many of our kids are from Washington Heights, are from Inwood, and this location would be in their neighborhood. So I say this pretty much to create a partnership because we are theater-based performing arts college-bound preparatory to see if there's a way that um, specific nonprofits could collaborate to create more youth opportunities. I'm just pretty, my question is just like focusing on youth advocacy and creating more opportunities for the youth pretty much. Yes, yes, and thank you for that. You know, thank you for that. And we, we should also connect, um, you know, so please email me, um, me you know, peoplestheaterproject.org. Uh, yes, yes to both answers. <laughs> yes to both questions, sorry. For the first one, um, we absolutely will be having opportunities for youth. We've already been involved in SIA, but we're very small, so we've had like one or two. We hope there can be so many more. Um, and we've been involved through Catholic Charities and through um, in -room Community Services, but potentially we could become our own work site, right? Our own um, uh, provider, so we can have more youth. And what's exciting is like, it doesn't just have to be performers, right? Or people interested in education and working with kids because we will be doing tech right people interested in lights mm -hmm. and engineering and um you know people oh my goodness yeah. so it's very exciting that there'll be all the backstage stuff which we haven't done because we've been renting spaces or just doing stuff you know library doing wherever um, you know, so that, and i'm sorry i'm so sorry to interrupt you and it's so beautiful that you said that because we also have a tech initiative in our school that has at, at least 20 years with all our performing arts we have two annual performing arts and all the tech stuff is youth, everything by the high school students. Yeah. So it would be great if we could just like 
collaborate and you know work on on creating that for them oh my god i'm so emotional thank you yes yes and like really we one of the things that we said we're like we want it to be a senior space and mary's gonna help me do that like in the mornings you know between nine and twelve or whatever um and all the activities that can happen here we've worked with our senior center we've worked with isabella we'll plan to do that again um and then between three and six, forget it, it's a youth space. Like we want this to be their own space for them to run it, for them to really lead it, for them to center it, them to be organizing around there in addition to all the classes. So yes, 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 please contact me. I wanna be in touch even before the five years before this opens mm -hmm. to start building that relationship with the young people that you work with. Young people, I, I'm an educator, so they're, you know, they're everything. Fantastic. May you repeat your email before you leave, sorry. Yes, my email um, is Mino, M-I-N-O, at peoplestheaterproject.org. No apostrophe. And theater, we spell it T-H-E-A-T. -E -T. Oh, my God. R-E, R -E, not E-R, which is, if I could go back 15 years, I would have done it the other way. But it is what it is. But email me, and I will respond. Fantastic. Um Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, thank you, um, Fernando, and um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of the person who did the other presentation. Um, for your presentation, thank you, Mino. Uh, I'm super looking forward to this. It would be great for you to you know, come back because Absolutely. four years is a long time. Oh yeah, um, I'll come back a lot more. Me and you'll see, excellent. as you said, other colleagues as well who will be coming. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all so much. And uh, without further ado, at uh, 8.47, I'm gonna give the mic back to uh, Fernando who has already started screen sharing. Um, and also Mino, don't forget to be in touch with Jamirna and Jamirna with Mino, because this is a very exciting uh, shidduch, a little match that we've just seen happen here. Um, and Fernando, uh, talk to us about the Manhattan Waterfront Greenway. This is the Harlem River Greenway, correct? No. Well, sort of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm here to present on the Manhattan Waterfront Greenway. And let me just dive right in because it's just me tonight. So let me just. OK. So the Manhattan Waterfront Greenway is um, a commitment that, you know, started way back from Mayor Dinkins. Right. And the idea of kind of greenways all around Manhattan is, you know, very goes way back to, the, you know, to way back when to Dinkins time. Um, and so the Manhattan Waterfront Greenway project that we're looking at today, which is a partnership between EDC, Parks, and DOT, um, is looking at about 32.5 miles of greenway. And we're looking to really kind of what, 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 what was kind of branded or, or marketed as closing the loop. So finding what are those gaps within the island of Manhattan to connect to the greenway, right? We all know, you know, for example, on the west side, and on the east side, there's very, you know, long continuous greenways, but there's a lot of places where it cuts off. And those are kind of places that we've identified as gaps. So we're looking to close those loops. Um, and to do so, the previous administration committed 723 million to completing uh, the remaining gaps. And um, a lot of these gaps are actually in uh, environmental justice communities or you know, immigrant communities, low income communities um, for, for various reasons, right? Because there's been you know, a history of structural violence, highways that prevent the greenways from being there. And so um, three greenways that we're looking at and particularly are in Inwood, in uh, Esplanade Gardens along the Harlem River in Harlem and around the UN Esplanade to kind of fill in these gaps along with smaller kind of other gaps. Um, as I mentioned, the city has committed about 1.2 billion in total to close the loop um, and to create quality open space. Um, like I mentioned, that integrates these communities in Inwood, East Harlem, Harlem, the Lower East Side and the East Midtown. So really um, looking at these kind of gaps along the Harlem River and the East River. So, you know, what are the benefits of closing the loop? You know, there's many benefits. And one of the big things that we kind of say is the next big park in Manhattan is not a actually, you know, it's not in concentration, it's around the island. So, you know, providing New Yorkers with a continuous waterfront and open space um, that would bring online about 1,000 plus acres of new urban park 
uh, networks around the edge of Manhattan and making connections to the outer boroughs, right? That's also very important to me. Um, you know, providing over 10,000 daily riders with access, you know, to a network that is safe, that they can cycle, you know, along, you know, from Inwood to Harlem and not have to go, per, you know, through streets or maybe only have to go through streets in certain parts through, you know, upland connections, um, integrating resilient design into the waterfront, especially in these communities in Uptown, in East Harlem and in Inwood. Um, we know that resiliency is a big part, not just of, of New York City's commitment, but to the commitment, you know, to the needs of these communities. Um, and so making sure that resilient design and addressing climate change and sea level rise where possible is very much integrated into closing these loops um, and ensuring equitable access to open space for all Manhattan residents. Um, you can see a quick stat here that says three times as many waterfront gra gaps currently exist in low income neighborhoods, kind of to the reference that I made because, you know, planning, you know, we go back to the Moses days where, you know, highways were put in these communities that disconnected us from our waterfront. How do we address that, right? How do we create upland bike routes? How do we reconnect to the waterfront? And, and where possible, how do we create outboarding? You know, if we can't do it because there's a highway, how do we outboard it? That's one of the things that we're also looking at. So without further ado, kind of looking at the gaps and the upgrade areas that we're currently looking through through this Manhattan Waterfront Greenway larger initiative, we're looking at the East Midtown Greenway, what we call the Harlem River Greenway. And in those, on the side in parentheses, you can see kind of where they currently are. Some of them are in construction, some of them are in design, and some of them are in planning. Um, for the purposes of tonight, I'm here to present on the inward portion of the gap which is in currently in pre-planning design, and I'll get a little bit more to it on the next slide. But here you can see, for example, um, Fort Washington, which requires further study, which is not an EDC project yet, um, but you can see kind of what are these areas or gaps that we've identified um, to, you know, that, are, that we're hoping to fund through this uh, big chunk of the 723 million. Um, so that being said, I just wanna dive a little deeper into the Inwood Greenway gap. Um, which is a 1.5, 1.7 mile gap from Sherman Creek to um, Inwood Hill Park. And this includes the areas um, of North Cove and Academy Street. So talking about the Inwood rezoning, you know, there was some commitments. Part of the points of agreement was to create waterfront access on, on these kind of two areas on the waterfront, Academy Street and North Cove, and then the connection from Academy Street to North to North Cole, right? Those kind of street ends and making sure that where possible along those street ends, we can provide waterfront access and where not possible that we can provide upland connections. So uh, as I mentioned, it's about filling the gap and providing new waterfront open space and new up, upland bike route, uh, routes um, that where waterfront access is not possible. You know, there's, for example, a Con Edison facility there, you know, we're working with them and there's a lot of things and in, in investigation kind of, which is currently where we're at and some technical site investigations just to see, you know, what, what's feasible and what's not, where are easements possible and, you know, working around those things. So working very closely with parks and DOT. Um, looking at opportunities for the Greenway to include resiliency investment in areas that experience flooding impacts, particularly around the NYCHA Dykeman houses. We see that's a very uh, flood prone area. You know, it's, it's, it's public housing. So making sure that we integrate resilient design into this waterfront space um, and the needs of the community um, and addressing, uh, you know, longstanding community and city vision through um, looking at the 2011 Sherman Creek Waterfront Master Plan and extending that uh, to the residential community, uh, extending the residential community to the waterfront. Um, so just to give a quick status on this project, it is funded um, through the 723 million. Um, a design team is on board for the North Cove and Academy Street Parks um, and both Greenway, uh, both the Greenway along the Sherman Creek waterfront and the upland uh, bike lanes are in the planning stage pre-design. Um, so we're hoping to begin planning work in quarter one of 2023. So in the late winter of 2023, early next year. Um, so with that, you know, we, we do have a, a design team on board. Their name escapes me, honestly, at this point, but I can get you their name. And we're hoping to, um, in the fall, come to the community board with the design team, you know, continue to speak with elected officials to start an engagement, a community engagement plan. Um, but I think what we're thinking is before we start a community engagement plan, we want to come to the community board and see what does that community engagement plan look like? How do you want to be engaged? Who should we be talking to? 
who should be a part of this process. You know, a lot, you know, we're right now we're virtual, right? And like mm -hmm. you said, Liz, we may be in September back in person, but I think a big part of community engagement has now become digital, right? So how do we address all of those needs? How do we make sure that our engagement is not just in person and meeting people and, and hosting workshops, but also how do we meet people where they're at? How do we also create engagement that is virtual, that people can join, whether it's through Zoom, through a survey at their own time, at their own pace. So coming to the community board, hopefully sometime in the fall, might not be September, might be October, hopefully September, the sooner the better, but we wanna create a community engagement plan with you, and when I say with you, with all the community, so that then we can begin the community engagement plan, so that the engagement plan can be informed by the people who will be impacted mm -hmm. by this project and who this project is meant to serve. So I want to actually just jump open in. Open up to questions. Oh, perfect. So I want to <laughs> jump in a little bit in terms of community engagement. Um, I would encourage you, obviously, to come to this committee and probably traffic and transportation as well, because there is a piece of that um, I would encourage you to talk to the folks at the Parks Department um, and look at some of the work that they've done in terms of portals and uh, iterative feedback and just really easy ways in English and in Spanish for people to offer their ideas. Um, I, would, I would encourage you to talk to I guess it's DOT when they were looking at the city bike rack placement, they had this really, really good online tool where there was a map and you could put like a, a you know, an X where you thought that a, a dock bike should be and you could provide comments or if somebody else had made that as a suggested site, there was a really easy way for people to provide feedback on pluses or minuses for that site. So you have a lot of that um, expertise from some of these other agencies. Um, I also, we had a couple of meetings ago, a really, really good presentation um, around uh, renovations for a, a, it's a site of basketball uh, on 186th Street. And um, Councilwoman De La Rosa was that we were still fully on Zoom, but not everybody has access because of the digital divide. Her staff had um, in her office and also at a local barber shop, zooming in from these two different locations with robust public participation from those two locations on that Zoom. So I would encourage you to talk to all of these people on some of those ways of getting um, folks involved. Um, yeah, I would and, and also suggest that you sponsor, you know, co-sponsored with the local council member and the community board, a, a public engagement session that either is, you know, like a scoping meeting and an ideas meeting, um, a visioning session, there are different ways to do it could be in person, could be virtual, could be hybrid, uh, depending on what is the usual, um, you know, what's the norm at that point. So those are some suggestions there. I also, I know we've got some questions about it, but I'm wondering if you could just go a little deeper on, you mentioned climate change and, and uh, rising um, tides, but can you talk a little bit more about how this planning um, I don't think it takes, um, I, I think it's not hard to figure out that there's a sort of obvious problem uh, with that. And since this is all waterfront, uh, what's the resiliency plan for dealing with all of that and incorporating those concerns into the design? Yeah, for sure. And and just to address some of the quick, quickly, you know, like I mentioned, we are working very closely with Parks and DOT. This is kind of a a, 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 a three partnership relationship between Parks, e, uh, EDC and DOT. Uh, so we we are talking very closely with them and looking at a bunch of resources. You know, I think um, Espaillat's office recently released this map where people can like pinpoint and, and talk about like infrastructure needs. So just looking at uh, all of the tools and resources that people are using, you know, and then you know, we don't want to recreate something that's already existing. So we definitely want mm -hmm. to just round up all of these resources and then create a tool with anything that addresses any gaps. Um, and we are working very closely with the elected officials office. Um, you know, Councilmember Carmen has been 
great in offering feedback and connecting me with folks in Dykeman House, you know, in the Dykeman Houses. So mm-hmm. um, we, we, like I said, we hope to have a very robust engagement plan. And in order to create that engagement plan, we want to work with the community to create that plan. Um, and so just to answer your question around resiliency, that's kind of where we are at now, um, which is why we, you know, we were hoping to start the community engagement this summer, but then we quickly realized, you know, how do we bring resiliency and resilient design into this? So that's where we're at in this pre-planning. Um, so we're doing the technical analysis to understand, you know, what are the flooding impacts in the neighborhood? What are the needs? How can it be addressed? You know, one of the things that we're looking at is wetlands, right? There is some you know, it's this this area will be right connected to Swindler's Cove and Sherman Creek, right? Academy mm-hmm. Street, for example. So how do we not, you know, connect, make this a continuous connection? Do we, you know, ex- do we create a, a living shoreline? Do we create wetland restorations? Kind of looking at all of, you know, what's feasible. So that's kind of where we are now. So that when we come to the community in the fall, we can say, you know, we did this study, this technical analysis, and these are kind of options that are feasible based on this location, based on the geography, and then work with the community to kind of, you know, figure figure it out mm-hmm. more, more robustly. I, uh, before I go to questions, I'm, I'm just going to push back on that a little bit. It, it totally makes sense that you need to, you know, talk with your technical people and have a little bit better of an idea of a presentation before co- coming to the community to present what your ideas are. That said, I uh, am a big fan of early, of engaging with the community early and often. And I think you're not going to go Uh, you're not going to regret maybe having a meeting over the summer and saying to people, we don't have a plan yet. Part of what we want to do is hear your concerns, hear your expertise, and you can do that in parallel, not in series. So while I appreciate you're not going to have a fully articulated plan until later, I would respectfully urge you to engage with the community beyond this presentation sooner and and you know why pick do both yeah no and 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 to that point liz you know one of the things that we're in conversations with with the design team is you know um coming to the community board and just presenting on the resiliency aspect right because there's the whole greenway aspect which includes you know waterfront access and bike lanes and and you know what what's going to be in this park in this area but we want to kind of come to the community board um you know i guess it will be in september unless we can do like a special session in the summer but just to get feedback and just you know like like you were mentioning earlier the the residents are the ones that know best right like we can do a bunch of analysis and look at what floods but people will tell you what floods right people will tell you what street what corner where the pile where the puddles form right and so we we really want to start doing that as soon as possible. Um, like I said, we're very, you know, pretty early on on the resiliency. We just got the design team. We're, you know, mm-hmm. so we do hope to do that. Um, what you just mentioned, um, relatively soon, because I think, like you said, that feedback and that citizen knowledge is very important to any study that that can happen. Great. So with that, I'm gonna uh, unmute. Uh, I've got uh, Allegra Legrand, um, and then Dave Tom. Oh, super. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Allegra Legrand here, uh, lead author of National Climate Assessment and expert on extreme climate change risks. Um, I've noticed that you've done quite a lot of hand waving without any specific numbers with respect to how high you intend to build uh, this infrastructure. Uh, what specific kinds of resiliency you're planning for? Are you planning for heat waves? Are you planning for coastal storm surge? Are you planning for extreme precipitation? Uh, Haven't really said. Um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind providing any detail to what you mean in specific by resiliency and climate change. These are just, they, they feel like, I, I don't know, like go words that you're just peppering in here without any substance to them. So I am, I'm actively listening to what you say. Yes, no, thank you for that. So I think when we say resiliency and climate change, you know, I think from, 
you know, preliminary what we are thinking. And like I said, you know, we, we want to come to the community very soon to understand, you know, exactly what, what those things mean for the community, right? Um, and I think the two things that we're looking at is one, so sea level rise and, and coastal, you know, coastal flooding. So when there's a storm, the flooding that happens, but also addressing sea level rise as it, you know, as it, as it, as it's gradually happened. And then the second thing is extreme heat, right? So how do we make these spaces not just, you know, uh, responsive to, to water, but also understanding the extreme heat effects in really all of upper Manhattan, right? So, you know, trees, vegetation, shade, looking at all of those uh, issues. When I think mean, that's when we talk about resiliency, those are the main two, um, but I there may be more, you know, <laughs> for sure. Okay, just, just to pull things apart here, mm -hmm. uh, sea level rise, uh, not gradual, this we can prepare for, it's the storm surges from hurricanes and other kinds of tropical storms and converted tropical storms, but a lot of two storms. That's one component extreme precipitation from regular rainfall like happened uh, early July last year where everybody was waiting mm -hmm. through the subways. Uh, that's not a tropical storm uh, related kind of extreme precipitation phenomenon and heat waves are separate. So those are actually three separate phenomena, not two. Do, do you know that they're three? Yes, yes, sorry. Okay, uh, I'm gonna let and and to that to that point with with the precipitation, that one's actually one that we're looking into um, at the moment because um, I believe you know that with the Con Edison, there's like a CSO nearby. So look and you know, uh, like I mentioned, this is a, a an area that floods not just from storm surge, from also from increased precipitation. So that's also one that we're you know hoping to look at very closely. Great. Next up, Dave Tom. Dave. All right, wait a minute. Let's see if. All right, Dave, are you? There we go. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Uh, hi, Francisco, Dave Tom uh, here, Inwood resident, uh, dad, bicyclist, etc. cetera, uh, engineer. <laughs> um, so very strong supporter of their overall close the gap plan. Thrilled that you're looking at the Inwood segment. It's terrific. I just want to understand a little more about the scope. You're you're referencing the 1.7 mile gap, which yeah, it's a huge gap, but you're only really talking about the um, the little parks on North Cove and Academy, which you know there's like 1.6 miles besides those parks. So mm -hmm. is this just about the park design, or are you saying that the idea, the general scope here, is to I see the reference to Upland is the idea to create you know bike lanes on Ninth Avenue and go around the MTA yard on Broadway and, and, and then up 10th Avenue and then across to 18th Street to create an on-land connection to close the gap? Or is this about waterfront? Because most of the waterfront is privately owned. The inward rezoning allows for the possibility of a trail, but it's entirely dependent on each individual parcel being developed, which might happen in 30 years or 50 years or never. So could you just explain a little more about what the scope is of this greenway gap that you're in that you're planning for yeah for sure so like i mentioned you know this is a partnership between edc parks and dot so from edc's perspective right what i can talk to about today is these two areas that edc is managed is managing which is the academy street park and then the north cove park um there will be you know as i mentioned kind of uh some parks between the two or some public access to the waterfront. And as you mentioned, some of these sites are private, you know, are private sites. So working as those areas become developed for those easements, right? Um, and the DOT component comes in where, where they're gonna be looking at where are these upland bikes and how do they also connect to where the waterfront access is available, right? So that it's 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 a it's a connected kind of uh, system. So for the purposes of tonight, I'm here to talk about those two sites in particular, Academy Street and North Cove, because that's what falls under EDC. Um, you know, the upland bike routes that falls under DOT. So I can't speak to to those uh, portions of the of the plan or of, of the Green Manhattan Greenway per se. Um, and then uh, you know, and then Parks has other other um, you know. Eventually, this the the the, par the sites that we are constructing will be managed by parks, right? So that's why we have to have those very early conversations with them. But yes, you're right. For the purposes of tonight, we're talking about Academy Street and, and North Cove. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, next, I'm actually going to call on Mel S. Hello. Hi. Hi, good evening. What's your question? Okay, my question is, if somebody has more questions about the Inwood, uh, the Inwood Greenway gap, do they contact the EDC or do they contact you, uh, Mr. Ortiz, directly over the summer if they have more questions about this, this presentation? Yes, you can contact me directly. So um, I am the Assistant Vice President for Government and Community Relations, and I oversee up, uh, Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. So any EDC projects, whether it's the Greenway, whether it's ERPAC, that, you know, that you have questions on, you can contact me. And if I don't know the answer, I, I will you know, connect with the project manager and, and get those responses. So any questions that you have around any EDC projects, whether it's in <clears throat> Upper Manhattan or the Bronx, feel free to contact me with those questions. Okay. Can you yeah. give your email yeah, address? I'll, I'll put my email. Um, no, you don't, have, you don't have the capacity because we don't have um, chat we just have Q and A. So if you could just say slowly what your email is. Perfect. Uh, and then people can write it down. So my email is F O R T I V at E D C dot N Y C. So I'll repeat it. My email is F O R T I Z at E D C dot N Y C, which is four T's at edc.nyc. Very, that's an easy way I remember it because I forget my email sometimes too. Excellent. It's your first <laughs> initial and your last name. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Maggie. Uh, yeah, I have a question about um, another link that uh, I don't think you included in your um, gap analysis, mm -hmm. that being the lighthouse link. And um, you, you might argue that, well, there's an upland greenway. I don't know if you've been up there uh, or if you've seen any of the uh, helmet cam video uh, of how dangerous and how dilapidated this thing is. Um, and, you know, it's going to cost a great deal of money to fix. And I'm not even sure that the proposed fix, <laughs> whenever it happens, is going to make it safely wide um, and and all of that. So, um, you know, why why did EDC decide that it wasn't going to include that link in its analysis of gaps? Uh, and could it? Yeah, so um, I, I just took down the slides, but I'll share the slides with, I share the slides with Liz. So um, if, if and if anyone wants the, a copy of the slides, feel free to, to email me. We did, a, so that what you're uh, pointing at is what we're calling the Fort Washington um, uh, gap. Um, that, that portion right now is under park still. It's not an EDC project. It has been identified as a gap. Um, and so, but that site, as you mentioned, there's a lot of complications with that site. And so there's a they, there needs to be a, fe a feasibility study that needs to be done. And so I think right now where that kind of gap stands is that they're looking for the funding to do that feasibility study, which we're hoping to get that funding soon. Um, there was an earmark that was put in, you know, uh, Congress member Espaya has been very supportive and, and the borough president also has been very supportive. So we're hoping to, um, I see someone from Parks here nodding their head so they can talk a little more, but um, it's not an EDC project per se yet, but it has been identified as a gap um, there is a further feasibility study that needs to be done. Um, there's currently funding, you know, there's currently the search for funding to do that feasibility being sought out. And as you mentioned, it is a, it is a complicated site. So, um, but it, it, to answer your question, it is a gap that has been identified. And Parks is very interested in closing it. Um, yeah. Over 15 years ago, we started sort of the Lighthouse Link and applying for different federal appropriations mm -hmm. for it. What the hope is with the funding that Congressman Espiat is, is helping uh, champion is that we can identify what are the cost of each of the components uh, that will need rest, uh, restoration, restitution with DEC, 
the easements, the force account with Amtrak for doing, ultimately getting them to review a design that's gonna affect their operation. We have experienced that with the Wind Deck Bridge, of course. Um, a whole host of issues, because we what we really want is a blueprint for how it can, it can happen and a more realistic cost of what it's going to take mm -hmm. to achieve all of those different components. And so mm -hmm. that's why we wanna have this deep dive feasibility study that the federal government is funding, that we hope the federal cool. government will fund. Um, and Fernando, I'm, uh, just in case you're not aware of it, I will forward to you um, the resolution that the board wrote about our interest in pursuing the Lighthouse Link and in getting uh, funding for it. And I have to also give a shout out to Maggie, who was really um, uh, instrumental in kind of lighting a candle under our collective institutional butt to, um, to do that to do that rezo. So I'm gonna let uh, Danny get the last word on this and then I'm gonna uh, move the agenda. Danny. Uh, cool, uh, pretty cool presentation. Uh, that'll be awesome if all of Manhattan is linked up. Uh, the question is how soon will there be like a, a actual design of, of this path or these paths because I'm like, figuring i'm like visualizing it in my head uh, a path going under the broadway bridge out over there uh by like the north tip of tip of manhattan i've been down over there it's like kind of like sketchy i want to say um and and i'm like thinking about like all the other paths that like go around uh the 207 street train station out over there uh the amtrak that's like the, the Amtrak that's like by the north on the north left of Manhattan, like that little beach area. I don't mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. um, that's my, my question is like, how soon will there, will there be a, a real design um, path looking visualization for people to see? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, we're hoping to um, come to the community board uh, and start uh, to talk about what an engagement plan can look like. And we're hoping in the fall, we can start that engagement plan um, or, you know, late fall, uh, late fall, early winter, start the engagement plan. And we're hoping to go into design in the first quarter of next year. So next year, you you all will probably see a lot of my face and a lot of my colleagues face as we come and, you know, design, you know, we start, you know, it goes through percentages, right? They'll go through 40% or 30% design. And, and, and throughout all of that time, there'll be, uh, you know, we're, we want to make sure um, that there's ample opportunity for feedback and comments, yeah. right? That doesn't work. This doesn't work. This should be looked into. So we're hoping to start that design work in early next year. Um, and in late this year, we're hoping to start the community engagement process that will um, feed into that design work, right? And then while we're designing, we'll continuously be coming to the community board to show the design, to get critique, to get feedback. And then um, hopefully, you know, if everything goes well, um, by the end of uh, 2023, we would complete design or early 2024. Right. And, and just to answer, you know, quickly make reference, you know, we're, as I mentioned, we're not just looking at, and we're also looking at Esplanade Gardens. So kind of further down more in Harlem and we have other projects, the Harlem River Greenway. So there's a lot of projects that, both EDC and Parks and, and DOT have um, as part of closing the gap. So, you know, um, for the purposes of tonight, we were just showing you these two gaps in Inwood, but um, hopefully in the next, you know, year or two, there'll be a more kind of more visual uh, design that people can see and, and, you know, really give feedback to and, and really start cool. to visualize it. Cool. And I, and again, I would encourage you to, you know, obviously, come to this committee, come to traffic and transportation where, where that may be appropriate, but also, um, you know, one of the things that the council members have done, that the parks department has done, that DOT has done when they have some of these larger scale design things is they work in partnership with the electeds, work in partnership with the community board to get the word out, but have these very focused, specific, 
community conversations, design charrettes, uh, whatever you want to call that, that are maybe a couple of hours long and dedicated to just that, as opposed to a 30 minute agenda item on a community board committee meeting. So it's important to come to the committees, but I think, you know, this is a, this is a big project. Mm -hmm. This warrants, um, you know, its own dedicated um, time and meeting in person, online um, to engage the community. And I don't, I don't actually think you need to wait to the fall. Uh, I think it would be good if you had, I mean, EDC has done things over the summer before in previous years. Um, so I feel like that is a good preliminary step and we can help get the word out. Uh, but I would encourage you to um, do that. Yeah, and for sure, I, I you know I can speak for EDC. We're definitely open to doing all that. You know, we as I mentioned, we just got a design consultant on board. So if the community board is open open to having a, a special meeting in August, we're happy to come in August and talk about you know start to have these conversations. Um, right. And I, I mean, what what I'm saying is that it doesn't. All of your meetings do not necessarily happen no, have no, to be sure. community board meetings. No. So. For sure many people go on vacation and the community board does not have official meetings typically over the summer. Um, some committees do, um, but attendance isn't required at them. There should be robust engagement with the community board, but you are also, don't let the fact that we are not meeting, you know, it, it's not appropriate for an agency to move forward with something that is binding. Um, but if what you're looking to do is preliminary community engagement, you don't, you can work in partnership with us, we can help to get the word out, but that's not, that's different from a community board meeting. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. And we can talk offline on what's the best, you know, way to do that. But I think that you do not necessarily have to wait until the September meeting of this or some other committee. And you also do not necessarily have to wait for an official community board meeting that's calendared in July or August. No, yeah, I, I completely understand that and, and I agree. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've been in we've been in uh conversation with um, you know, from the Congress member to the council member to the state assembly member to the senator to the borough president. So especially with the council member and, and you know, about this, right? Like I said, what does engagement look like? How soon can we start? How should it happen? You know, do we mm -hmm. start with digital? Do we start with in person since it's going to be the summer and people might want to come out? You know, so we are in conversations around all of those aspects. Cool. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, trying to be mindful of time here. We're way over, it's 9.23. Um, thank you so much, Fernando. I look forward to seeing you um, soon and often. Uh, in terms of, on the agenda, I had, I had written two items of old business, um, not so much as discussion items, but just as a way of making sure that we keep them on our radar. And in consideration of the time, uh, I'm just gonna note, that we expect uh, hopefully a presentation from Parks uh, in September on the 186th Street, excuse me, basketball um, renovation. And uh, we don't have anything new on Parks renamings. Um, so we're gonna continue trying to work with the Lenape Center um, on that. So if nobody else has items of new business, I am happy to accept a motion to eat dinner, by which I mean a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All righty. All those in favor, please hit leave meeting. Thank you so much. Take it easy, Chair. Take it easy, folks. Have Thank a good you. night, everyone.